Is the mic on? Yes. The mic's on. Okay. Everyone, please take your seats. We want to get started. Okay, we look good. Welcome, welcome everyone. Happy to see you here in our early spring, watching the uh, cherry blossoms bloom for the outer towners who are coming from cold country here. So thank you everyone um, for coming this morning, taking your time. I also heard that the trains are kind of messed up this morning, so some people may be coming in a little late but we want to get going, so we'll have introductions. And then at some point, if we need to acknowledge people for the record, we'll make sure everybody gets written down that they're actually attended if they come in late. So let's go around um, and introduce yourselves. And remember also that to, to every time you speak, please use the microphones. And please state your name so that everybody can know who is speaking, and for the record as well, for the card as well. Okay, so I'm going to go to my left. Good morning, everyone. My name is Susan Rosen Singleton. Is that yeah, your microphone is not on. I, I realize. <coughs> Testing, one, two. Oh, here we go. Good morning again, everyone. My name is Susie Rosen Singleton. I'm the Chief of the Disability Rights Office of the Consumer and Government Affairs Bureau here at the FCC. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Elliot Greenwald, Deputy Chief, Disability Rights Office. Good morning, everyone. I am Theodore Marcus, Deputy Chief, Disability Rights Office, starting today. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Phyllis Ginevan, and I'm here representing the Association of University Centers on Disabilities, AUCD. Good morning. My name is Maggie Nigren. I'm with the American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. Tom Litkowski, Comcast. And Susan Masroe for Linda Vandeloup at at and And Jerry Barrier with the Perkins School for the Blind. Good morning. I'm Scott Davert, representing Helen Keller National Center for Deaf, Blind, Youths, and Adults. Good morning. I'm Stephanie Cool with NCTA, the Internet and Television Association. Larry Walk, National Association of Broadcasters. Tony Stevens, American Council of the Blind. Good morning. Tim Cregan, U.S. Access Board. Gay okay, Jones, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Good morning. Good morning. Helena Mitchell with the Rehabilitation Engineering Research Center for Wireless Inclusive Technologies at Georgia Tech. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ron Pipler, a consumer from the great state of Montana. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm Gary Beam from RIT, National Technical Institute for the Deaf. Good morning, everyone. My name is Christian Vogler. I'm with the, um, do you know what it is? Technology for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing at Gallaudet. Technology for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing at Gallaudet University. Good morning. I'm Zainab al Kebzi with the National Association of the Deaf. Hello, everyone. This is Claude Stout. I'm the current director of TDI.
Good morning. This is Brian Unesco, deaf blind advocate. One second, please. Good morning. Zach Bastian, Verizon. Hi, I'm Susan Barr from Disability Rights Office. Hi, I'm Matt Gerst with CTIA. Um, buenos días, Maria Diaz, eh, representing the National Council for Latinx with Disabilities and DICAPTA. Good morning, John Carr, Dish Network. Good morning, A. Braffy from the ARC. Hi, Elaine Gardner, FCC Disability Rights Office. We're going to jump over. We're going to jump over the person sitting next to me, um, and I'm Karen Peltz-Strauss, Deputy Bureau Chief of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. And do you want me to go ahead? Um, sure. Yes. We'll okay. Yeah, so um, thank you all for coming. We are delighted to see all of you. We have terrific attendance today, and we really appreciate your taking the time to make it to Washington D.C. Fortunately, you've hit some good weather. Um, and we now have a speaker that is the Chief of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, Patrick Weber. I'd like to hand the mic over to him. He'll say hello and give a few remarks. Thank you, Karen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Karen said, I'm Patrick Weber. I'm Chief of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau here at the FCC. Uh, I wanted to spend just a few minutes with you this morning, um, kind of going over what, um, what we've been doing here at the Commission in general. Um, and also to thank you for your service um, and your contributions um, for the DAC. Um, Chairman Pai also wanted me to pass along his regret, regrets that he was unable to make it uh, to today's meeting. And he also wanted to thank you for your service um, and your contributions to the important issues that are before you. Um, I know each sub subcommittee has been working very hard, and I look forward to the subcommittee reports um, and a recommendation from your video programming subcommittee uh, regarding best practices for video description of visual but non-textual emergency information provided by broadcasters. As you may know, the Commission, under Chairman Pai's leadership, considers access to telecommunications for people with disabilities a priority. Among other things, this includes the Commission's efforts to close the digital divide and expand broadband across America. This will especially benefit people with disabilities in regions where broadband is not readily available. For example, deaf, re deaf residents of rural areas would have greater access to VRS and video phone communications. Recent steps the FCC has taken to expand broadband include, earlier this year, the FCC adopted a mobility fund framework to allocate up to $4.5 billion over the next decade to advanced 4G LTE service. Primarily in rural areas, that would not otherwise be served without government support. Chairman Pai is also working to implement the next stages of the Connect America Fund, which will provide an additional $2 billion for rural fixed broadband over the next decade. The FCC is also focused on the affordability of broadband and new technology to bridge the digital divide. The Commission is taking a fresh look at the Lifeline program which helps bring affordable voice telephony and high-speed broadband to low-income households. The Commission is focusing on how the program can more effectively and efficiently help close the digital divide. It sought comment on potential changes to target funds to areas and households most in need. We hope that these efforts can especially help the community of people with disabilities. Again, I thank each one of you. I know you have diverted much of your personal and professional time to be with, here, be with us here at the DAC, and your efforts are extremely helpful and much appreciated. I anticipate that we will continue to see many more thoughtful and helpful recommendations from the DAC in the coming months. Thank you again for your service and time.
Sure. Yes. Th thank you so much. Thank you. Actually, thank you, Patrick. We really appreciate your stopping by. Sure. And uh, I, just so that you know, as you probably already do from my uh, informal conversations with you, we have tremendous support in Patrick. Um, he's always had our back, and we really appreciate it. It's been, it's always great working with you. Thank you. So thank you. <coughs> yeah. Thanks a lot. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Patrick. Thanks, Karen. And um, uh, this is Will Shell. I am the designated federal officer for the this DAC meeting, and um, I wanted to mention a few quick things. Uh, first, in case anyone wants it, the Wi-Fi password is FCC eight two three. 302, um, and it's it's uh, posted around the room. So uh, if you if you need it later on, you, you should be able to find it. Uh, uh, Lisa had mentioned uh, some of the basics for the communication rules. So uh, raise your hand to try to get the camera uh, on you before speaking. Try to say your name uh, when you are beginning to talk. And. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I wanted to also just give a, a quick mention that <clears throat> these meetings, uh, this is the first one that I've been trying to uh, mainly set up myself with uh, Elaine's help as backup, and uh, it's it's uh, certainly not easy. There's a lot of other FCC staff who are uh, pitching in and doing a lot of uh, things um, that uh, can't be done by one or two people. So. Uh, I want to um, I want to just thank them. I'm I'm not going to name them all. There, uh, they'll they'll be around. You'll see them. Uh, thank them if you get the chance. And then uh, mention the bathrooms are out the doors that you entered. Um, uh, one one uh, short distance, uh, 20 feet. Follow the wall to the left, and the bathrooms are on the left hand side. Most of you have been here before and are familiar with the layout, but if not, this is a very friendly audience. Reach out, ask somebody. Uh, they, they'll be glad to help you. <clears throat> and then also, uh, make sure to get some breakfast, and uh, we will be having lunch. That is uh, sponsored by CTIA. Uh, having the food here is really, really nice, and it's not, uh, it's not an insignificant um, effort to uh, to get that all set up. CTIA, uh, Matt Gerst is here representing CTIA today. Thank you very much for that. Um, and with that, I will pass it on to Sam. Sam there's a mic here on the right. Good morning. This is Sam Yale from Level Access. Welcome, everyone. And I didn't introduce myself. I'm Lisa Hamlin, um, co-chair with Sam, and I'm from the Hearing Loss Association of America. So let's move along. You should have the agenda. First up is uh, yes. Susie Rosen Singleton mm -hmm. and Elliot Greenwald from DRO, Lisa, who will provide Lisa. updates. Lisa. Lisa, I'm, pass I'm sorry. The mic to Karen first. Remarks. Karen, Karen, Karen. Go first. Oh, Karen, you want? I thought you. Okay, I did. Okay, I ahead. did. I'm, I'm okay. taking the mic back. Um, <laughs> so, um, I just wanted to. Um, first of all, I wanted to acknowledge uh, that, as usual, we have a number of people from the Disability Rights Office here. Um, and if all of you from the Disability Rights Office can stand up for one moment, I wanted to just show you the representation. Um, so. Appl yes, applaud these individuals. Um, we thank them for coming. And you may notice somebody new, Theo Marcus, at the end, is our new, one of our newest uh, members of the office. He is now our deputy, bureau, deputy division chief on complaint issues. So if you have a, an accessibility complaint, an inquiry, Theo will be overseeing the complaint team. And we're delighted to have him. Um, and I also wanted to formally welcome Will, as this is his first meeting, as the DAC uh, designated federal officer. We'll be talking about you later, Elaine, but, um, <laughs> so I'm not going to go there. But um, I did want to say, Will, it's, it's a wonderful, it's a delight to have you take over this role. Um, 
as we've mentioned before, each one of these events is like planning a wedding. I think Will has gotten his first taste of that, and um, we always appreciate how smoothly everything goes and is, during these meetings, and it already has started smoothly. So welcome and congratulations already. And now I'm going to turn it over to Susie. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Good morning again, everyone. I do want to echo Karen's comments, welcoming Theo Marcus, and also congratulating Will Shell, and of course thanking Elaine for her amazing work to launch the Disability Advisory Committee, the DAC. So just we definitely want to thank Elaine. She's done such a wonderful job, and I think we all have seen the uh, results. It takes a village. We've all seen the fruits of her labor. and it takes all of us to make the, uh, F the DAC successful, and Elaine has been instrumental in that. I do want to provide a brief overview of what we've been doing since our last meeting, which was in October. There's a lot of rulemaking procedures that have been underway, not only with disability rights, but disability-related matters as well. And so I'm just going to update you. Feel free to ask questions when I'm done. Uh, there is actually a tremendous amount. It's going to be presented at a high level, the 30,000 foot view, because there's so much. So the first thing to talk about is hearing aid compatibility, otherwise known as HACC. As you know that we uh, adopted new rules on October 26th of 2017 to update the requirements for hearing aid compatibility and volume control on wireline and wireless telephones. Now this order does the following. It approves a new wireline hack volume control standard. Secondly, adopted a requirement for volume control in wireless handsets. And thirdly, eliminated an obsolete wireless handset standard, as well as implementing a provision of the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act, CVAA, to apply all of the Commission's hearing aid compatibility requirements to wireline telephones used with advanced communication services, including phones used with voice over internet protocol or VoIP services. We'll be releasing a public notice this week to give you more information about the effective dates of those rules. The next topic I'm going to cover is RTT, or real-time text. And as you know, we've been trying to deploy RTT as recognized as a superior solution than over TTYs. So we're transitioning to new technologies. The rules uh, starting January 1st said that RTT would be uh, deployed rather than TTYs. And we have seen some demonstrations of that already. We've been very impressed and pleased uh, by the efforts that the companies have been undertaking to deploy RTT. As recently as November 3rd of 2017, we released an order granting the petition of T-Mobile USA for clarification of the 2016 real-time text report and order. On November 3rd, rather, we released an order to clarify the obligations of the carriers for emergency communications. The wireless carriers are not responsible to transcode the RTT communications to TTY. Rather, that is the responsibility of the PSAPs, the 911 call centers, in other words. <clears throat> and the ESI Net, the Emergency Services Internet Protocol Network, otherwise known as ESI Net, uh, was responding to T-Mobile's request for clarification. Moving on to the next issue, which is video programming. And there are several areas underneath video programming. I'll begin with captioning. Starting December 22nd of 2017, rules were implemented that were adopted in the 2016 order 
um, the closed captioning second report in order, which will implement a compliance ladder for the closed captioning requirements. So that means that we'll, the compliance ladder mean, uh, in other words, that means if there is a violation, then we can have, the, the consequences will be increasingly severe for each additional violation that is accrued. So that's what is meant by a compliance ladder. We also have rules requiring video programmer registration and certification compliance. That will be effective at a later date. And we'll announce when that's effective. It's not yet in place. Moving on to video gaming. I'm sure many of you can relate to this issue. Maybe, if not yourself, your, your children uh, are involved in video gaming. And that is covered by rules for accessibility. We have granted a final waiver to the Entertainment Software Association, ESA, on December 26th. And that waiver will expire on December 31st. And they have been engaged with consumer groups and various stakeholders to make sure that we have the best possible practices for accessibility vis-a-vis -vis video games, video gaming. And finally, video description. On January 12th, the FCC's Media Bureau released a public notice announcing the top 10 non-broadcast networks according to the Nielsen ratings. And we will then look at the exemption petitions and announce the top five non-broadcast networks for the new requirements of video description for the next three years. And that to start July 1st of 2018. Moving on to the next area of activity is emergency communications. And there has been a lot of activity in this space. First, I want to start with the hurricane response. On December 7th, an invitation for comment went out about how accessibility worked vis-a-vis -vis people with disabilities and uh, among other issues during the hurricane season. We wanted to understand what the experiences were of people out there during the hurricane season of 2017. And we'll be like to host at least one public workshop so we can evaluate the findings. And the comment period closed February 21st. Then there's the EAS roundtable, the Emergency Alerting System roundtable. On January 18th of this year, we had a roundtable with consumer organizations and we again invited addition, additional comments about the September 2017 test that was held nationwide regarding the emergency alerting system, wanting to know whether it was accessible. We were hoping to release a final report about those findings. And it was a very valuable roundtable, so we want to express our appreciation to all those who participated, including many of you. Moving on to WIA, the wireless emergency alerts. We released a new report and order on January 31st to improve geo-targeting of messages to make sure that they only reach those who will be affected by an incoming emergency. That requirement will be in place by November 30th of 2019. And the second report in order also requires that, that those messages remain on your devices for 24 hours so that people with disabilities and others can find that message and have access to it and continue to have access to be able to review at their convenience for a 24 hour time period. Next, moving on to general emergency communications. On January 30th, a preliminary report was released about the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency's January 13th, 2018 false ballistic missile alert. 
We'll be continuing our investigation. We'll be releasing a final report on that to protect against future false alerts. And we've invited consumer organizations to give us feedback about how to ensure that people with disabilities have access during a false alert incident. And we've received some input that we really appreciate. We'll be reviewing all of that. And after we release the final report, we'll be partnering with FEMA to have outreach efforts to various stakeholder groups to implement best practices. Moving on, uh, last item under the emergency communications is the text to 911 item. I want to let you know that this month uh, we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of 911 communications. The first call to 911 was made on February 16, 1968. So much has happened since. And so we want to commend uh, the progress that we have made and make sure that 911 communications is accessible to people with disabilities. And that's where text to 911 comes in. And we just announced that the state of Maryland actually has just announced that they'll be able to deploy text to 911 statewide. For more information about uh, whether it's available in your area, you can visit www.fcc.gov slash text hyphen two hyphen 911. And we're looking forward to RTT uh, being another textable option when, it, when PSAPs are ready to accept such calls. The next item, I have two more items to cover from updates of DRO. Bear with me and then I'll be passing the mic. But uh, the next item is that we are pleased to announce that we have created an American Sign Language video library here at the FCC. And you can find that page by going to our website, www.fcc.gov backslash disability. You'll be able to find the ASL page. And we have about 20 ASL videos up on that page right now, and we're expanding even as we speak. So bookmark it, check it often at your convenience. Finally, I do want to mention the Chairman's AAA Award Ceremony, which is the Awards for Advancement in Accessibility. The period for nominations has closed, actually today. <laughs> and we'll be announcing the winners for the Chairman's AAA uh, event on June 28th. And this award recognizes the efforts of organizations, institutions, and companies, government agencies as well, to make communications, products, and services more accessible for people with disabilities. Um, that, and this is for products or services newly introduced to the market. For more information about that, contact Chairman's Triple A, that's AAA at FCC.gov. I look forward to hearing uh, any questions. Obviously, see me at any time throughout the day. I know I shared a lot of information. It's been a very busy time, and it would not be possible to do that without your engagement, your comments, your questions, and your feedback. You make our work possible, and the collaboration is key to con our continuing success. So I thank you for that. Uh, and I'll throw it over to Elliot. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll let you know about a few TRS items that have uh, been taking place since the last uh, DAC meeting. Um, the Commission has been accepting applications for the renewal of certification of the state TRS programs. Uh, the comment period closes on March 9th for 28 state and U.S. territory applications, and on March 12th for an, an additional 20 state applications. Uh, the comment periods for the remaining six states and U.S. territories uh, will be announced at a later time. Um, the rules permitting assignment of um, ITRS telephone numbers to hearing individuals for point-to-point -point video calls and permitting at-home call handling rules for VRS became effective on October 17th. Um, 
ZVRS and Purple were permitted to begin their at-home call handling pilot programs on November 1st. Um, on December 29th, uh, the Commission released a public notice announcing that the TRS user registration database it was ready to accept registration information for registered VRS users. Um, and VRS providers uh, were required to submit registration information, uh, user certifications of eligibility, and user consent to submit the information to the database for all registered VRS, VRS users by February 28th today. Uh, thereafter, uh, uh, registration information, self-certifications. Um, anyway, the, uh, since then, ZVRS and Purple and Convo have requested extensions of the February 28th deadline. Um, and the uh, Commission um, ha will, will be releasing an order this morning. Uh, it will be a Bureau-level order to address that. And I'll keep you in suspense because after the, uh, after the order is released, um, I will report on that um, either later this morning or uh, when we come back for lunch before the uh, TRS, uh, you know, before the Relay and Equipment Distribution Committee uh, meets, we will, you know, reports, w um, I will report on uh, the order that will be released this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for your report. Do we have any questions from anyone? Christian? This is Christian speaking. I do have a question for Susie related to the captioning compliance ladder. And I would like to ask you if that um, is part of the UI issue, for example, uh, the ability to turn on or off the captions. And I just wondered if that was included or not in this compliance ladder. This is Susie speaking. Um, Elliot, uh, I, want to, I just want to double check with Elliot, make sure that I'm giving you the right information. My understanding is that is only related to captioning quality. So user interface requirements are under a different proceeding. Um, Elliot, am I speaking correctly? Okay. So, um, but we do take um, all alleged violations very seriously, and we want to work with industry to ensure that the resolutions are speedy, regardless of whether it's uh, they're using the compliance ladder or some other mechanism. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Okay, thank you very much for your report. We appreciate it. Um, we'll move along now to the subcommittee reports. We're starting with the video programming subcommittee. So we'll, it's Tom? Okay, go ahead, Tom. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, so I think whoever created this recommendation was paid by the word, um, because it's a long one. And uh, bear with me as I as I work my way through this. Um, somehow I drew this lucky straw of reading this recommendation to the group. Uh, I think also Ron will update uh, you folks on the other piece. So I'm here to talk about a recommendation that we're putting forward concerning emergency crawl uh, information uh, conveyed visually. Uh, and so we'll, we'll read the recommendation and we'll certainly take any concerns or questions following that. Uh, and then Ron will, I think, update on the caption and description transmittal working group. This is a, a working group that's looking at um, exploring possible recommendations that could come at future meetings in terms of how uh, caption files and description files can remain intact as programming assets uh, move across uh, uh, from platform to platform. So from the original programmer to, you know, a distributor, 
maybe from distributor to distributor, uh, certainly from broadcast to online platforms, um, on demand, et cetera. So uh, that working group will also be meeting as a reminder after the DAC meeting today. Um, so if you have any questions on, on that, please uh, see me or Ron afterwards. So uh, on to the recommendation of the uh, DAC video programming subcommittee on best practices for graphical emergency alerts. This is revised as of January 26th, 2018. Uh, this was a consensus uh, vote reached uh, uh, through the subcommittee and more than 80% of members uh, voted to move this forward. So this pertains to the uh, matter raised by the Federal Communications Commission, the Commission, requesting the video programming subcommittee, subcommittee of the Disability Advisory Committee, the committee, to review and provide recommendations on the following concern. The concern is to develop best practices for the oral audio description for people who are blind or visually impaired of visual but non-textual emergency information provided by broadcasters, such as the critical details of an emergency conveyed by the radar maps and other graphical displays. And the committee, or the subcommittee, sets forth the following uh, recommendation. One, whereas 47 CFR section 79.2 paragraph 2 calls for emergency alerts conveyed in a visual manner during programming outside of news and breaking news segments to be accessible to individuals who are blind and visually impaired. Two, and whereas such efforts to make emergency programming accessible have focused on conversion of text crawls to audible speech through the use of a text-to-speech TTS protocol carried over a secondary audio program, SAP stream. Three, and whereas advancements in broadcasting have allowed for the insertion of images and moving graphics conveyed through a dynamic video image crawl to augment through traditional text crawl on the lower third of broadcast programming. And four, and whereas such images and dynamic video image crawls have the potential to provide audience viewers with detailed information provided through automated video feeds, such as those provided by weather radar providers, and in doing so, create a dilemma as current TTS protocols are reliant upon text, are, are, are reliant upon text scripts and therefore unable to identify images in a manner that could be conveyed in a textual way identifi identifiable by existing TTS protocols. Five, and where is the nature of emergency alerts covered under section 79.2 section or paragraph two can occur at any time with no to little warning and thus pose multiple constraints towards finding a solution that relies on human description or other traditional means of adequate scripting text for TTS. And six, and whereas the commission in seeking the advice of the Disability Advisor Committee on the best practices for orally describing emergency information provided visually during non-newscast programming has resulted in the committee after spending a in the subcommittee rather after spending a significant amount of time over the past year examining the issue identifying no clear technical technical solution capable of describing images or dynamic video images in a timely accurate and reliable manner capable of being deployed across existing broadcast systems Seven, and whereas the committee in further working to gain clarification and examples of critical details of emergency information under section 79.2 paragraph 2 conveyed via an image or dynamic video image and not included in the accompanying text crawl has resulted in the, in the subcommittee being unable to find instances where the critical details were only conveyed via image uh, or dynamic video images. 
although the finding of no such examples does not mean such instances are impossible. Eight, and whereas the subcommittee has been informed that the use of images or dynamic video images passed through such emergency crawls during news and or breaking news segments covered under 47 CFR section 79.2 paragraph 1 serve more to reinforce already described or explained programming by the broadcaster. And number nine, whereas until a solution exists to remedy the issue at hand toward describing stationary and dynamic images passed through emergency crawls, greater attention must be given to assure that broadcasters employ best practices to describe such images. Ten, and whereas none, and whereas none of the uh, sub, sub tech, uh, as as, and whereas none of the subsequent recommendations should be construed to express an opinion about any rule or the application or waiver of any rule, including the other provisions of Section 79.2, other than Section 79.2, Paragraph 2, and only pertaining to and accessibility of images and dynamic and dynamic video of emergency information. Almost done. <laughs> now, it is, one, recommended that the Commission consider the findings above that there are no solutions available to ensure timely, accurate, and or reliable descriptions of images and dynamic video displayed as part of an emergency information crawl over existing legacy broadcast systems over the foreseeable future. Two, and be it further recommended, in order to not distract future progress toward identifying technology capable of being deployed over emergency systems that hold greater potential for developing workable solutions for accessible emergency information the Commission subsequently moved to extend the waiver of the Section 79.2, Section Paragraph 2, requiring requirement that images and dynamic video displayed as part of an emergency information crawl be described for five years to cover covered entities covered under Section 79.2, Paragraph 2, and 3, and be it further recommended that the Commission call upon industry and consumer groups to work together toward finding workable solutions for emergency broadcast systems, and in the interim, consumer groups and industry leaders work together to assure that best practices are communicated to stations for potential use when stationary and dynamic images displaying emergency information are broadcast in a manner applicable to Section 79.2, Paragraph 1. That is the recommendation. Uh, are there any concerns or questions, comments? Uh, Susan uh, Masrui uh, has a question. Actually, uh, just a comment to make sure I'm understanding this completely. Um, basically, what you're saying here is there's no known technological solution that in f there might be one in the future, so maybe in five years, come back to revisit it uh, with cooperation among industry and consumers and, and everybody else. Is that basically it? Yes. Yes, and this is Tom. In a nutshell, that is correct. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments? This is, this is Lisa. This is Lisa. Um, it's the, the committee is proposing this for a vote for the full deck, is that correct? That is correct. Mm -hmm. um, can we, do we need a second to have this considered? Do we need a second if the committee is doing that? Hi, this is Will. This is Will. Uh, I believe that the normal process would be someone's going to have to uh, second it, yeah, uh, to have a vote. Is that what you mean? Okay, can we have a second for this proposal? 
Okay, okay, we have a second, Susan. Let me also add, before we go forward with discussion on this, that we have some of the members of the committee have arrived since the initial introduction. Um, please um, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe Maggie from, excuse me, Brian Scarpelli has arrived, right? Brian, Everin, Everett Bacon from NFB. Is there anyone else who's come? after introductions. Could you... Um, Maria Kirby. Maria Kirby from Apple. Okay, great. Maria Any Kirby from Apple. Okay, terrific. Anybody else? Rachel. Rachel Nemeth. And Eddie Martins. Rachel Nemeth and Eddie Martins. Okay. Martins. Say them in the mic, please. Anyone? One more? Mention them in the mic. So uh, we'll just we'll just get uh, all the names on the microphone for the record. So uh, Maria Kirby from Apple. Uh, Eddie Martinez is here. Rachel Nemeth is here as well. Hello, Rachel. You got Brian and Everett. And also uh, Brian and uh, so Scapelli and uh, Everett Bacon uh, is also here. Uh, if um, if anyone else ha has joined without uh, mentioning their name, uh, at some point we'll we'll try to go around and get their names on the on the record as well. Okay, are we good? Because I just wanted to make sure everybody was mentioned so we know who's here for the vote. Um, now we're open. We've had a second. We're open for discussion and explanation. Any questions, please? Helena, please go ahead. Thanks for the presentation. My question had to do with the five years. You know, technology is moving really quickly, and the ability to actually do a lot of the uh, solutions, particularly images, is also moving quickly. So uh, my question is, why five years? Would, would you want a shorter time period to encourage industry or those working in this area to come up with solutions quicker? Because five years seems a long time. So this is Tom. Uh, I'm going to ask. Uh, Tony Stevens and Larry Walk to uh, uh, advise us here. So as you know, with this subcommittee, um, prior to the subcommittee working on the FCC assignment that we were given, um, the American Foundation for the Blind, the American Council of the Blind, mm -hmm. National Association of Broadcasters have been working together uh, on uh, figuring out uh, kind of where solutions might lie for enabling description on these uh, dynamic video or stationary images that a company crawls. Uh, and so, uh, Tony and Larry, can you address the question, please? Sure, Tom. This is Tony Stevens with the American Council of the Blind, Director of Advocacy and Governmental Affairs. We have been working, like Tom said, along with NAB. Mark Reichert is unable to be here today. He's up on the Hill um, for a thing they're hosting. Uh, and it's a good question because it came up several times in our video programming deliberations. You know, initially the proposal that was first introduced was to rescind this. Um, and, and encountering, and, and as one of the principal authors of this recommendation, uh, we moved towards a seven year, uh, primarily because ACB, we've been very much involved on the research side of specifically those technologies you mentioned. Uh, you know, there have been a lot of folks that have been saying, well, if we can get autonomous vehicles on the road in 2019, why can we not describe something on the bottom of the screen? I think it's, it's, it's fair to say that one of the solutions that we talk about in the recommendation uh, is going to essentially be that the, the type of broadcasting that is, is delivering the current system that's out there that has sort of created this problem uh, as that phases out, that actual system phases out, which would be the system that would have to find the solution, identify a way forward, and implement it, that, that's, that constraint is going to be one of the barrier breakers that, that leads us towards a solution as we move into, what is it, Larry, is it third generation? What is the? ATSC 3.0. ATSC 3.0. Um, as we move more towards IP-based broadcasting, uh, you know, the, the technology, there are solutions out there now that can remedy problems with dynamic images and provide description. There's nothing as of yet that could, you know, that has been designed, but we at ACB came up with a proof of concept that we felt in certain technical situations, 
but again, those technical situations are essentially constrained by the real life conditions that exist within the broadcast control rooms that push out these emergency crawls. Uh, and the way that the video feed is pumped in by the, the primary or dominant person that has this technology available, uh, the, the weather company that, that pushes this technology out. So to that end, uh, I, I think five years was, you know, a, a compromise we came to. Some had said three, some had said, you know, let's just not put a date in it. But it, in a sense, it was a compromise date with the understanding of it'll give us time to move towards the next generation uh, where I believe, you know, once more and more Americans move towards like an IP-based delivery system for their broadcast, I think we can create like an API, which is an app overlay that could essentially work towards describing things. Uh, but until that time and the time that it would take to implement and roll that out, uh, we're, we're probably, you know, five years was, was uh, I think, a, a, a fair estimation that can at least get us uh, up to the next step, as, as it were. Does that answer your question? Thank you, Tony. Yes, thank you. All right. Okay. Um, Tim had his card up, but did you want to add to that, Larry, before we move on to Tim's question? Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Is it on? Um, I, just, I just wanted to add that um, I can't explain where we are in the progress of the technology any better than Tony just did. But I can assure you that even under a, a five-year extension of the deadline, we're not going to just sit around and wait five years and then start to look at the problem. We're always, and we have been actively trying to work with potential known developers of a, uh, of a technology that could possibly work with our legacy broadcast system. Um, we work very closely with all kinds of vendors who supply systems and equipment to the broadcasting industry. And unfortunately, so far, none of them have come up with a uh, technical solution for, for automatically uh, translating these dynamic maps. I should also add that, um, and we'll continue to do so, and if a technology, uh, if we can find a technology sooner than five years, well, of course, we'll go ahead and implement it as soon as possible. We have no interest, broadcasters have no interest in um, reducing the number of viewers or audience members that we, that we can uh, provide programming to and, and, and uh, enjoy our programming. So we're actively working always on trying to find something. We just haven't had any, any luck yet. Um, I also wanted to add that, uh, well, I, I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Okay, Tim Cregan, you're up next. Yeah. Tim Cregan, you're at Fast Board. Um, I just wanted to thank the members of the subcommittee, uh, Tom, for your very excellent report, and Tony and Larry for your clarifications. So I have a question about additional uh, items in this. In paragraph 9 and then in recommendation 3, you make reference to best practices. and from reading this, it's not clear to me, are there existing best practices to which you're referring? Are you intending to develop best practices? Is there some sort of process for this? I was wondering if you could maybe provide us a little more information about when you talk about best practices, what does that mean? How is it developed? Who, who has input into that? How is it enforced? Those kind of things. Thank you. So, so th uh, this is Tom, uh, and uh, this this was uh, uh, the effort. Uh, I, I believe uh, the recommendation three uh, talks about. Let me just make sure. Further recommendation uh, calls upon inclusion consumer. Okay, so um, the best practice is this came up out of you know wanting to provide something to stations. Uh, that would uh, provide them with some key information on how to describe images to people who are blind or visually impaired. And so um, uh, I believe, uh, Larry, correct me if I'm wrong, that, that uh, you and Josh and NAB were going to uh, work with uh, an organization to find ways of, of con uh, getting those best practices out. And we were working with Joel Snyder from the Audio Description Project uh, to uh, uh, provide some high-level best practices that, that could aid in, 
you know, the ability of, you know, uh, a, a station to describe images so they, sh should they so choose to do so in a way that's more meaningful and contextual to someone who's blind or visually impaired. Do I have that correct, Larry? Um, well, actually, Tony was up first, so. Well, uh, okay, go ahead, Larry. One. Yeah, yeah, Larry would, yeah. <laughs> yes, um, th this was a, pr a proposal that came from uh, Joel Snyder at ACB, who's also been on the subcommittee and working group and, and, and very active and had some great suggestions for improving the recommendation before you. The idea, as I understand it, is uh, a kind of aside and apart from the challenge we're having with creating audible crawls for dynamic images like moving maps, we also want to try to improve the way broadcasters describe emergencies uh, in general for the benefit of blind and uh, visually impaired people, stationary maps, other kinds of information that might be on the screen during an emergency. So what we have in mind, what we envision so far, is um, trying to come up with some best practices uh, with a lot of help from Joel and from various broadcasters and news directors and uh, come to some sort of consensus on best practices for how broadcasters could approve some of the way they describe emergencies. And uh, un I understand that sometimes they over-describe things it can make it harder for people who are using visual description technology to sort of sift through and get the critical details of an emergency. So um, we're going to put together a uh, document of best practices that we will circulate to the industry as well as do a webcast or a webinar sometime between now and June or July possibly and um, try to reach out to groups and as well as broadcasters to educate them on uh, just how to improve the way they describe these situations. Um, I should add that we think an industry effort in coordination with um, the advocacy groups is the best and only way to pursue this. Uh, this is content, so the FCC should probably, in our view, should not be involved in you know, creating best practices or directing or influencing any way the way the content is described, but industry in partnership with the advocacy groups should uh, could take the lead and, and put together some good recommendations. Uh, Tim, you want to follow up? Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Larry. So are you saying that these best practices are something that the members of the committee are going to assemble? reaching out to your contacts in business and advocacy groups. Is that what you're saying? Uh, more the merrier. We would, we would love your input from the committee, from the subcommittee, the video programming subcommittee, from the emergency uh, communication subcommittee of the DAC. Um, we're, we will welcome input from, from anyone who has views on what the best practices should look like. Okay, not, not to beat a dead horse here, but I'm just trying to understand because the issue of how you describe images is, is something that comes up, you know, whether a description is adequate or not. And over the years, for example, when the Access Board has looked at these kind of issues, we've looked to um, guidance documents put out by different broadcasting groups where they've talked about best practices that that particular group uses. Um, at the end of the day, what we end up doing is, is we don't specify a particular best practice. We just report to a series of resources and we say these are potential resources out there. So I guess what I'm trying to understand in this context is, as Susan clarified, this is a five-year waiver um, while they're trying to come up with a technical solution. And in the absence of a technical solution, there's going to be recommended best practices to industry broadcasters on how to describe images. And these best practices are going to be compiled by the committee, which will then refer this to the FCC for, what, a recommendation to broadcasters? I mean, I'm just trying to understand how this all fits together. Thank you. This is Tony. Because um, the best practices, as, as mentioned, was um, you know, it's something that Joel Schneider and those that know Joel 
Um, you know, he's been part of audio description since audio description was, was a baby. Uh, and, and he runs, uh, he ru has his own, obviously, efforts that he runs out of Tacoma Park in audio describing, but he also works with ACB very closely with a ACB's audio description project mm -hmm. that we put a significant amount of energy into, and he runs the Audio Description Institute, which is essentially sort of a, a training program twice a year that brings in people internationally and around the country uh, to learn just that. He has a curriculum set up that has been sort of vetted over over the years, and you know, so I think it's fair to say in, in Joel's recommendation and his concerns that, uh, you know, which, which sort of brought us to this recommendation uh, is that, you know, there, there are probably few people that are as immersed in, in audio description as Joel that at least we've come in contact with ACB. Doesn't mean that there's somebody else out there, but we're very fortunate to, to, to have Joel sort of be a champion of audio description who works with us on a lot of projects. ACB is very much committed to working with NAB. We're, we're very thankful to, to Josh and to Larry as well in, in really sort of opening up this, this issue. When we talk about the, the dynamic images and the, or static images, the graphic images that, that crawl across the screen, uh, they, they, the times when we found them happening were under 79.2.1, 2.1, I guess, or is it 2, how would that be written out, 2 subparagraph 1, I guess you'd say. Uh, and, and in that time, that's when either during an actual breaking news segment or a newscast, when we would have these extra visual elements moving across the stream. They don't necessarily relate at all to the five-year uh, five uh, waiver, as you were. That's in regards to 2-2. Two, two. Uh, and, and so therefore, in a sense, uh, they are a bit separate, but both came out of the identif identifying the need that you know we do have a solution within two one where we have humans on the screen that are doing that description and what needs to be done as they are held to be able to describe what's going on during emergencies uh, is to find a way that they can make sure that that's being most conveyed on the screen with so much things moving on uh, so much real estate trying to, to pipe through information uh, that they're doing in the best way possible my understanding is, and we're working with this, and we're already very fortunate as an advocacy organization uh, to, to build this relationship with NAB and with the other partners of NAB. Uh, the Radio Television Digital News Association has, has already been engaged, and I think we're going to be working the webinar through them uh, to broadcast directors, news directors around the country. Uh, our hope is that, you know, we can work towards creating best practices. It, it was not in the interest, and I say this too, as I mean, I am a, a hardened advocate, but I come from as a broadcast journalist years ago in the 90s. Um, in that, you know, I understood the concern that uh, is its government is it is it government's role to say, uh, in a sense of of uh, you know, within in confines of the news situation, the news being piped out, uh, you know, specifics and description, and there were concerns around that. Uh, we believe that you know, if we were just informing and educating and getting those journalists to be able to describe the weather reporters, the anchors to describe the best way on the screen, um, you know, we feel that that is something that can be done uh, between advocates and industry, and already we're moving toward beginning that process. So, so Tim, this is, this is Tom. I think the other way to look at this is the recommendation really isn't for the subcommittee to go and develop best practices, right? I mean, it, it's m more to, uh, you know, from the, from the commission side to encourage advocates like ACB, NFB, AFB, whomever else, uh, to work with industry, NAB, and others uh, to to come up with these best practices. Uh, so this would not be a subcommittee project. The video programming subcommittee will not. Members of that subcommittee may participate in this consumer industry collaboration, but this will not be an official subcommittee project to develop these best practices. What this was all about, where this came was, we didn't want to lose the opportunity uh, when Joel raised it to encourage more effective description when anchors, whether uh, meteorologists, reporters are on screen and live during news and breaking news coverage of emergency information to describe more effectively. So this is really more of a recommendation in three here to encourage that industry consumer collaboration on these best practices and that they get shared in whatever way that collaborative group deems most effective to get the word out. 
Helena, you're up next. Uh, my comment piggybacks on Timothy's. One thing that I think you should do is you're saying you're going to develop the best practices. I, I would encourage you to contact NOAA, particularly Mike Gerber, because he is also working up a set of best practices on how to get images and information out during emergency situations. And I realize that uh, Thomas just said that the committee is not itself going to be participating in these best practices, but there are a lot of us working in this space already with dynamic images and how to roll it out. So if you could share it, the drafts at different points with the committee members, we might be able to provide some solid input that would help you. Absolutely. And this is Tony, go ahead. Tony, if I may. Tony again. Um, most definitely, I mean, as, as, as you know, as ACB continues to, to stay engaged to make sure that this is getting done, I mean, we, we obviously, with our audio description project, welcome all people uh, with an interest in anything to do with description of the visual world uh, in a manner that can be best conveyed to people who are blind and visually impaired. So we most definitely would enjoy anyone in this room, anyone listening uh, or, or following this situation to very much get involved. And I mean, we reach out, uh, you know, to to, to other advocacy groups as well and would welcome them as well to participate in making sure that this is the best, it truly is a best practices and not a one-sided practice. Uh, Ron? Thank you, Tom, and everybody for the discussion on best practices, the term best practices. I've been involved with four working groups here in DAC, and in each working group we've been trying to develop best practices. So I have a question for the commission. Okay, in the rules and the standards, did the commission ever refer to best practices? And the the word says the industry should follow best practices for such and such a thing. Where does the commission stand on best practices? So yes, uh, this is Karen, and um, the answer, the short answer is yes. Uh, best practices are actually considered a very good thing. They're not always rules, they're guidance, but actually we have even gone a step further where there are captioning quality rules which incorporate best practices that were in fact put together by jointly, by consensus, by service providers, consumers, and members of the industry. And it was a very productive process, uh, a very helpful process to have these general guidelines. Uh, in fact, our, our rules require certification uh, with, of compliance with our closed captioning quality rules or the best practices. So yes, they are very much a part of our rules. We refer to them very frequently. Um, and um, I understand that you've been reluctant as a subcommittee to develop these best practices to date. However, I don't think that anything precludes a, a change in view at any time in the future. If the uh, subcommittee has determined that that's not the way you want to go and you would like to take this outside of the subcommittee, that's fine. Um, I agree with Helena that five years is a long time in this evolving, rapidly evolving technological environment. Um, so. We have asked you as the experts to come up with a recommendation. If this is what you've all agreed on and presented and you think it's the best approach for now, then it's up to you to decide as a committee whether or not you want to agree to the recommendation and it's fine if you do. I mean, that's we, we've asked you for your recommendation and if this is your recommendation, it's fine. Um, but just be cognizant of uh, how fast things change. I mean, all you have to do is look at the distance between 2010, for example, when the CVAA was enacted, and now to see the number of areas where there are already gaps um, that didn't exist back then, and and that will those will continue to grow. So again, I you know I I I, I think that it's important to recognize that this was a consensus decision. And if that's the way the subcommittee would like to go, it's totally up to you. But, but in fact, um, the existence of best practices it can, have, can have the force of law, or they may not have the force of law. They could just be guidance. It depends on what you want to make them. Were there any other questions or comments? Anybody else? 
Oh, there is one. I'm sorry, I can't see who that is. There's a hand raised over there. Thank you. The, this is Maria Diaz. Um, so what um, we commented in the, uh, during our meeting is technology is not always the answer to solve issues related with access to information. So uh, just uh, to clarify a little bit, uh, it's not Joel's position, it's the education awareness and editorial responsibility from broadcasters will definitely help to support the effort of giving accurate information included in images during emergencies while the technology is ready to do that. So the intention with the best practices is uh, just to spread information about the needs and, and make sure that someone is trained and would take care of the description needs in their capacity um, from the industry. Um, so just to clarify that it's a, a different approach to solve the issue. Okay, we have anything else? Any other discussion about this recommendation? Then we're ready for a vote, and how we do our votes is that we go around the table one by one, announce your name and your vote up or down. Um, I'll head toward my right, so the first one is Phyllis. Phyllis Ginnivan from AUCD votes yes. Maggie Nigren, AAIDD, yes. Brian Scarpelli, ACT the App Association, yes. Everett Bacon, National Federation of the Blind, respectfully votes no. Tom Lukowski, Comcast, votes yes. Susan Masroy, AT&T, votes yes. Jerry Barrier, Perkins School for the Blind, votes yes. Scott Davert, Helen Keller, National Center, votes yes. Stephanie Cool, NCTA, votes yes. Larry Walk, NAB, votes yes. Tony Stevens, American Council of the Blind, votes yes. Tim Cregan, Access Board, uh, abstain. Helena Mitchell, Wireless RERC, a question of protocol. I want to make an amendment to reduce it from five to three. So am I voting no now, or are we going to still, because we haven't discussed if anybody is recommending. Helena, say okay, you want to make so an I have amendment? a question of protocol. And maybe Will or Elaine can answer this. Um, I would like to make an amendment to say, to reduce it from five to three years. Because as Karen's just said, and all of us around the table know, technology is just changing so quickly. And most people, if you give them five years, they'll wait till year four to do something. So if we make it a little bit faster timeline. So, I mean, we didn't ask for amendments or anything. I don't know what to say. Hi, this is Will. This is, hi, this is Will. So uh, I guess as a point of clarification, um, it, it was my understanding that there was a, um, we may have done a few things out of order. Uh, right now we are taking a vote. Uh, and we're taking a vote on the motion that was seconded to take a vote on as, as written. Um, we probably should have asked if there was, you know, during the discussion, if there was any amendments, uh, if there was any amendments, whether or not it was seconded and whether or not, yeah. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, because, uh, because there was so much discussion and because there was the, um, the request for a vote and the second before the discussion, I think we may actually want to rewind. I know uh, we're halfway through the voting process, but we may want to rewind just to make sure that we follow uh, some proper procedures that if someone wants to make an amendment or another point, um, that, that that can be clarified before we go to the final vote. Um, so what I would suggest we do and I'll leave it up to the uh, co-chairs to decide. But 
We are going to be having a, uh, a guest in just a, a few minutes. And um, if we want to uh, um, rewind, open it up for discussion, a guest will come back in. A guest will come in. Uh, we'll hear that. We'll take a quick break. We'll come back. We'll finish the vote. Um, but in the meantime, if we can roll this back and start again with discussion, if there's any m amendments or further discussion, we should clarify that before we move on to uh, the motion for the vote. Okay. Okay. So we're going backwards here. Um, clarification. And we're going to, I guess, not. The vote so far is not happening. We have to look at an amendment if you're proposing an amendment of how that goes. So Helena, okay. I think we'll go. Let's, let's see what your amendment is, and then we can have discussion about okay. that. Um, this is Helena. I would like to recommend that it be reduced from five to three years. The main reason is I know a lot of the engineers at the NAB, and if they put their mind to it, they can solve this problem sooner rather than waiting till year five. Okay. So we can have a discussion about the amendment itself. Okay. Correct. Can we do that? We need a second. We need, we need a second, second for that. Do we have a second on the amend proposed amendment? Gary, Gary is the second. Are we doing this yeah, that's right. Gary. Okay, so we have a second. Now we can talk about a, a proposed amendment to this. Go ahead, Tony. This is Tony with ACB. Um, you, your your request, Elena, was was discussed or not discussed? Excuse me, discussed um, in in great detail uh, in the video programming subcommittee. Uh, ACB, as as a side note, has worked with the NAB engineers. We have had meetings with NAB engineers. We have had meetings with uh, folks working in Silicon, Ga Silicon Valley who are working on machine learning, artificial intelligence, um, essentially the frameworks that will be necessary to create a solution. Uh, the whole time we have been doing this, uh, it, is, it is fair to say when you look at the transitions that it took to go, say, from analog to digital on the external transmitters, uh, when you look at the arc that broadcasters would have to procure equipment, after even developing equipment, testing equipment, getting approval for that equipment, uh, and then being able to implement that equipment uh, based in, in, as well as we've talked about, essentially the issue is with sort of the chain in which the video feed that exists is, is piped in to the feed that's then broadcast out and then converted into multiple programming distribution streams if it's regular traditional terrestrial via cable pushed over IP, how that signal's pushed out. There are a lot of moving pieces to that. And yes, I will agree, ACB has been actively involved in, in folks with Silicon Valley and out on the West Coast in trying to find solutions with this, not just for this context, but when you look at like, you know, uh, how many videos were taken off of UC Berkeley's website the other year uh, after the DOJ decision. Uh, you know, there is a large space in which ACB is working with folks in the tech sphere to find specifically those solutions you find. And when we compromised on the five years with industry, I think it was a realistic compromise. I mean, initially we began with a complete rescinding, seven, we pushed it three, pushed it zero, came to five. Uh, my, my personal feeling with this, uh, representing ACB, a consumer organization that just as much wants this to happen as anybody else out there in the advocacy world, because it's our members that we're protecting and representing, is that the constraints are just unrealistic in a sense to get anything five years. So we're just getting distracted again. And in that time, and we say it in the recommendation, and the reason why I put it in there is we need to start looking at the other solutions to get proofs of concept out there that could be done tomorrow for, let's say, the, the app-based dis distribution folks, where these type things could get put in there. But that's not under 7922. So in that sense, um, you know, we're, we're in a sense getting, uh, my hope is that we're not getting distracted by this rule in finding specifically the solution that you and that Karen and others in the room have agreed that yes, we are moving at a pretty high speed and we can find solutions in there. I'll say that ACB is committed to finding these solutions. We're committed to holding NAB to their word and the broadcasters as well. And we're committed to working with anybody in this. But in terms of the three years, I would, I would not be in favor of that only because we have worked so closely external of this as well with broadcasters in the waiver petition request. 
uh, to know that, uh, you know, unrealistic, uh, you know, within that three, it, it's just going to put us in sort of a, a groundhog day, repeat, repeat, repeat type situation. Thank you. Okay, Larry. Again, I really can't. Again, I really can't say it better than than Tony. Um, I mean, five years might seem like a long time because technology in other areas and industry are moving so quickly, of course. But I mean, you you could strap a rocket to my Hyundai Santa Fe. That's not going to make it fly to the moon. It, it's we're trying to. Uh, come up with a technology that's applicable to the legacy broadcast system. That does not exist. The team at NAB, the team of engineers has looked at this. We've talked to all of the known potential develop developers, all the known potel potential developers in the industry. Tony has conducted so much research and time and effort along with us to working and coordinating with people in Silicon Valley who might have technologies rel related to artificial intelligence and other things. The technologies do not exist and they're not going to exist in the next three years. But if they do, we will implement them much sooner than five years as soon as we can. Um, I just think it's kind of, without knowing more about the particulars of the technical challenges we face, just saying that Oh, five years seems like a long time, and iPhones come out every other year. It just, it's, it's, it's kind of apples and oranges. We're trying to deal with the technical realities of the problem we're facing. Thank you, um, Tony, and thank you, Larry. Um, we're going to just take a little pause to welcome Commissioner Million Clyburn. Um, and because um, Commissioner is a woman of the people, she usually likes to sit amongst us. So we have a Ten card for you. Um, I don't think that she needs much introduction, so I'm going to just turn the floor over. You know how much she's done for this community. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Karen. Good morning, everyone. I, I can tell by the warmth uh, in the room that uh, <laughs> that a lot is is, is going on. Uh, but um, allow me to express my gratitude to each of you uh, for your dedicated service. You accepted this role because of your long-standing commitment to making the nation's communication services more accessible. On top of your regular jobs, because I, I did hear that you have regular jobs, and without um, additional compensation, uh, many of you have been serving for years. Uh, many of, all of you remain commitment, committed, and um, we are just, honestly, I, I, there are not enough words for me to express uh, how much gratitude I have for you. In, how much um, you have helped this agency gain some bragging rights. Um, and and, and I, I say that, uh, you know, uh, again, um, I, I mean every, uh, every syllable of that. You've heard me speak about improving accessibility among all communication services, be it by telephone, online, or broadcasting and cable uh, over the past uh, eight and a half years. The signing of the landmark 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act gave us the authority to ensure that our accessibility rules are now more closely aligned with the technologies people use every day. But you also make sure that uh, we do not rest on our laurels uh, because all of us know that there's just much left to do. Now, I understand that important topics, including real-time text implementation and deployment, technology transitions, emergency communications, and the National Deaf-Blind Equipment Distribution Program will be covered today, which is why uh, I am just, I maintain my enthusiasm and support uh, for uh, this uh, committee. With more than 50 million of our fellow citizens uh, being identified uh, with having a disability, it is critical that both legacy communication services and those new and emerging, tech, emerging technologies, the little southern draw just came out, sorry about that, are accessible uh, to all. That is why I believe that we must discuss these issues, not just when uh, there is a rulemaking or, or with accessibility in its title. We must discuss this in each and every proceeding before our commission. By this I mean if a proceeding will impact the general public, 
we must include in that discussion how those living with a disability will be impacted. No exceptions. Take the recent dismantling of the FCC's net neutrality rules. You did know I was going there, right? Uh, a free and open internet ensures that a broadband provider cannot engage in pay prioritization, throttling, or blocking of legal content. Now, why do I bring that up here this morning? In November, you may be aware, I shared a story of Alice, Alice Wong, who founded the Disability Visibility Project. In a video posted online, Alice discussed how the internet has helped her establish an online community among like-minded individuals and expressed that she felt that eliminating net neutrality will widen the digital divide, particularly for those with disabilities. Now, I do not have to convince this committee just how much the internet has unleashed tremendous innovation over the years, enabling more accessible services at lower cost. But what if one of those accessible services competes with an application affiliated with a major broadband provider? Would the repeal of our net neutrality rules incent a broadband provider to favor its own service by providing faster speeds and at the same time slowing down access to that competing service? What if an accessible video communication service developed by a startup was blocked altogether? Now, you may say that these scenarios would never happen, but my answer to you would be to check the documented track record of net neutrality violations over the past decade. But as we look further at our agency's policies, including the approval of recent technologies, I wish to highlight text to 911. I was particularly pleased to read last week that Maryland residents will soon have access to this vital service. For those who are deaf or hard of hearing, text to 911 is a game changer and I trust additional states will follow Maryland's lead. I am also excited to hear that many service providers and equipment manufacturers have taken the lead in implementing real text, time text, and by replacing TTY technology with real time text, those who are deaf or hard of hearing will have access to a real time text based service that is more modern and more efficient. In closing, I would like to thank uh, Elaine Gardner for her dedicated service uh, to the DAC and offer a warm welcome to Will Shell, who assumes um, uh, the role as a new designated federal officer uh, for this committee. I always thank Karen, so she's used to it, and uh, you know what she means to all of us. But thank all of you once again uh, for allowing me uh, an opportunity uh, to provide remarks this morning. I know we probably do not have time uh, for any questions, but if you have any quick comments in the minus 30 seconds that I have, um, uh, I'll be willing to take them because you know I give long-winded answers and you really don't want to ask a question this morning if you want to get back to the agenda or take a break. Um, again, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, Karen, I don't know if... Um, any questions for the commissioner? I think these. Well, hearing that, I will promise. I promise to talk. To, do, do you have a question in the back? I'm sorry. Um, I will see if I can get you maybe a little air in here. I don't know if anybody's <laughs> made a request. Maybe it's just me, and I'm getting I old. I do have a you know same, shameless plug. I do have a birthday coming up in a couple of weeks, so may, maybe it's that. But I'll, I'll see what I can do about. Uh, bringing the temperature down just a little bit to, um, uh, you know, I know your hearts are warm, but I, I don't know if you want everything else to be. <laughs> um, I, I did, I thought, I, Su was that you, Susan? Yes. Did you have something to? I was just agreeing with the heat. Oh, okay. Like possibly the age. Okay, I will take care of that um, in, in momentarily. Again, thank you, everyone, and continue to have a great meeting. <laughs> Th thank you, Commissioner. Um, we know that your time is limited. We really appreciate you squeezing us in and for being our weather person of the day as well. Thank you. Absolutely. Take care of that, right? So, so let's take a break. Oh, we take a break. Yeah, let's yes. Take a break. Yeah. Okay. Um,
we're going to take a break now. We have a break scheduled. Um, do we want to make it shorter? Let's make it to a quarter to ten minutes. It's about 10-minute break. So you can think about this amendment. When we come back, we'll, we will have more discussion on the amendment, and then we'll vote on the amendment, and then we vote on the entire um, re uh, recommendation. Ten minutes, back in ten minutes. Everybody back? Okay, we're going to have a change. We are going to change what we're doing here because several people have to leave. Everybody back, please, can I have your attention? Helena, please, let's go back. Uh, we're having a change in schedule. We said we'd we said we would go to a vote, but we're not. We're not going to continue. We're going to hold that discussion for a minute because some people who are on our schedule will have to leave soon. So what we're going to do is we're going to go right to the discussion of RTT deployment and implementation and the FCC research and development efforts, and then we'll go back to our discussion after lunch. But before we do that, I'd like um, Will to um, explain procedure here. So this is Will, and let me just say, I uh, during the break, I heard uh, many different thoughts and concerns about what the procedure should have been, and I'll just say that uh, I made a decision in the moment that I think was still the right decision, even though um, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't. It's, it's it's not nice to stop in the middle of a vote and go back and rewind, but I don't want to have a process um, that doesn't include uh, uh, all of the voices that can be. This is the only recommendation for this time. So uh, the plan now is to come back after lunch, finish the discussion on the proposed amendment. Once that process is finished, then I'm sure the vote will continue on the um, document either in its original form or as amended, however the process goes. So that's that's how that's how it is. Thanks. That's the uh, designated federal officer making decisions. We'll all just have to live with it. Right. And this, this is Lisa. I also I concur. I really think it's important. Um, the rules are set so that we can have a process where minority voices are heard. If somebody doesn't exactly do that, I still want I don't want us to get bogged down in rules. I want every voice to be heard, even if it's not exactly procedure. So I, I actually concur with Will's decision and thank you for, for being able to do that for us. So next up is the RTD discussion, but I noticed that um, Christian's not back yet. Where is Christian? Um, there are several people in this discussion. Was Christian supposed to be first up? He was, but it's not required. I'm sorry. It's it's not it's not can, it's not required. Can we move on to either to Ian. Ian and Zach? Zach, can we move on to you? Or you get started, then when Christian shows up, okay, would that be good? Go ahead, Zach. And Ian. And Ian. Ian. Ian Dillner. Yeah, Ian Dillner. Okay, um, Christian just showed up, so because he's the guy who we change things for who needs to leave soon. For Christian, you're the guy who needs to leave soon, so we're waiting for you now to start the discussion on RTT deployment. Can you go ahead? Are you ready for that? All right. Thank you. This is Christian speaking. Just waiting for Will to take his seat. Most of you probably know that Gallaudet University has been involved in researching RTT real-time text and pushing for the rulemaking to happen and working together with industry to encourage them to implement RTT. So that has been funded by a grant, to the RERC, 
Rehab Engineering Research Center at Gallaudet. And it's been transferred to RARC Center on Technology for Deaf and Hard of Hearing. So the scope has actually been limited a bit. It's looking at RTT in a specific context than it was before. But we're very excited to be looking into this venue and to be seeing the deployment of RTT happening across the nation. So that's what we've been doing is testing primarily. And we've done testing with the companies such as AT&T, Verizon, and just a little bit with T-Mobile. We've only been looking at the iOS beta version vis-a-vis T-Mobile, but with AT&T and Verizon, we've done some more extensive testing with their products and services. We've tested various things. Uh, we've called each other, one phone to another, and the interoperability testing therein. Richard Ray from the city of Los Angeles has also been working with us. He's been testing, uh, making 911 calls via RTT. And there have been a lot of positive uh, developments. We have verified that interoperability is happening. And we have verified that there are some implementations um, that have, have a very nice user interface. Uh, we've also identified some challenges and issues. Um, and I won't mention companies by name. But just for example, we have found some issues related to phone ringing and accepting an RTT call via a phone ringing. We've identified other issues with the user interfaces where if people are typing at the exact same time, there are some interfaces that are unable to handle that as well. So and we have reported those findings to the companies involved and people are aware of it and they're working on it to find effective solutions. Another positive outcome that we have found is testing, uh, calling from an RTT device to a TTY, and it works beautifully. I was really want to emphasize that that, that was uh, an effective solution that was developed. There's a company that has provided a gateway between RTT and TTY devices, and that gateway I, is able to identify that the call is going to a TTY user and is able to transcode appropriately for those messages to get through. You remember that TTY you cannot actually have uh, two people typing at the same time if you're both using TTYs. And yet this gateway has been able to realize when two people are typing at the same time and to hold the message uh, from one party so that the TTY does not receive a garbled message, but rather a coherent message from their interlocutor. So it's been very nice because it means that RTT users are not going to necessarily even be aware of what's happening on the other side. If they're calling somebody who's using a TTY, they don't have to have any concern about turn taking. And I think that should be the model for how companies work uh, to make this a user friendly experience. And I would encourage all companies to copy that approach, even though it's not required by any rules. Uh, so in conclusion, that is the work that we've been doing at Gallaudet, and there are some things that need fixing, and there are also some successes, some things that are already working well, and we're excited to see the further deployment of, of the devices and, and to do further testing. Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you, Christian. Uh, thank you to everybody at the deck. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you and good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Ian Dolner at Verizon. Uh, like Christian, I think we're very pleased that uh, pleased to be among the the uh, our peers in the industry who have uh, launched these first versions of, of real time text into the marketplace, and we're uh, very happy with the the first implementation, but recognize that this is an iterative process. Um, I wanted to. Uh, recognize the flexibility that the FCC rules enabled. Um, the, um, uh, th there was a debate, and I could imagine one went on in, in, in every company about whether an app-based approach or a native handset uh, device approach uh, would be better, and we wrestled with that. And uh, fortunately, the FCC's rules allowed for, for uh, alternate approaches. Um, we ultimately um, 
pursued a native device approach. And so the real-time text uh, that we were able to launch uh, with two different uh, uh, manufacturers, uh, Apple and LG, um, incorporates the real-time text capability natively in the device, uh, not on an app. There are pros and cons to each, uh, each approach from a user perspective and from a, a carrier and a developer standpoint. But uh, uh, we think that, you know, long-term the FCC was interested in, in moving toward a native device uh, approach, having RTT natively incorporated within the device, and uh, we, we pursued that. Um, uh, like I said, uh, you know, uh, one of our other peers in the industry uh, uh, that you'll hear from in just a minute <laughs> uh, took a different approach, and we think that that, that has a lot of merit, too, uh, that we considered. Um, by going uh, with a native device implementation, we had to work very closely with uh, the manufacturers that make the devices that we sell. Uh, we were fortunate to work with uh, both LG and, and Apple on the development of uh, these capabilities in their devices. Um, again, these are first implementations and we're, we're happy to uh, receive feedback. We've already received a good bit of feedback and uh, I know that we're, we're taking that seriously and um, I think this is the uh, sort of the first iteration, we have, uh, you know, Apple devices that are uh, uh, um, iPhone 6 and above are capable of receiving, uh, have, have received an update that, that allows real-time text and uh, the LG G6 device on our network that I also understand is uh, the same device that T-Mobile has activated uh, real-time text on on their network. Uh, so uh, there's been a lot of uh, cooperative work within industry uh, with carriers and manufacturers to, to develop this technology and there's certainly more, more and better things to come. Um, um, Christian mentioned some of the, the research that he's been doing and identifying the, the positives and, and some you know, not so positives about these first impl implementations and I think we're happy to receive that feedback and incorporate those ideas. Those ideas. Um, I know that there are others around the table that we've been talking to and we'd, we'd like to hear, hear more from, from those folks as well. Thank you. Ms. Susan? As um, this is Susan Masrui from AT&T, and AT&T did take a different approach um, than Verizon, and they're, they, like Ian was saying, there are pros and cons in in both. Um, we went met with consumers early on, and one of the concerns that they raised was that folks didn't necessarily want to buy a new device; they wanted to rely on what they had. Um, and so for the short term, um, we, we developed an over-the-top solution that's app-based. It's something that can be downloaded for free um, for, from the Google Store for its, or from the Apple Store, um, the App Store from Apple. Um, we have, and these apps will run on devices that are Android 4.4 or higher or iOS 9 or higher. So um, in most cases, there should be an app that would work on the device you have. Now, obviously, when you go with more a greater variety, there are more variables. So there's some challenges with that as well. Um, and we will be doing, obviously, switching to the uh, devices that have uh, the RTT capability um, built in uh, fairly soon. Um, but in the meantime, we have some options available. Um, we also made some changes in our billing systems. AT&T uh, modified its smartphone accessibility plans um, to include unlimited voice. The reason we did that was because RTT is billed as a voice call, so we didn't want folks who had um, a hearing loss or speech disability to have to pay more uh, for the services, so we just basically gave that away. Um, some of the highlights are, as, as Christian mentioned, RTT to RTT, um, from one carrier to another carrier, RTT to TTY, um, and the communications of voice and text simultaneously, the ability to use um, uh, foreign languages to send emojis um, and to have two-way communications. So it's 
um, at real time, which is, is pretty exciting. Um, we also are getting feedback and we welcome it. Um, if you're facing challenges or you know of issues, please let us know. We want to address them as quickly as possible. Um, we've started, um, we did some testing prior to launch with refreshable bra braille displays and, s displays and screen readers. Um, but the experience differs um, out in the real world from the test environment. So there are some challenges with that. Um, if you do have more information, um, it can be found at att.com slash rtt. So that's our report. Are there any questions for this group? Um, I'm sorry, I don't, okay, so I see. Jerry, do you go first, and then Tom. Uh, this is Jerry Barrier from Perkins. I'm curious to know more about the TTY to RTT option, whether that's only on uh, wireless devices. So, for example, could someone using a standard old TTY connected to a phone line somehow engage in, in calling via RTT? Thank you. Go ahead, Ian. Uh, th this is Ian Dillner at Verizon. Um, so as Christian mentioned, there is, uh, and this was one of the requirements of the FCC's rules, that real-time text be backward compatible. Uh, and to flesh out what that means, um, a person who has real-time text on their mobile device uh, can engage in a text communication with somebody with a traditional TTY machine. Likewise, a person with a traditional TTY machine can contact a user with real-time text and they'll have a text-based communication. That text-based communication is probably going to be limited to some of the capabilities of TTY and Christian mentioned one way that uh, might be a good way to work around some of some of the issues with uh, turn-taking uh, but yes uh, it works in both directions in that traditional TTYs are able to contact a real-time text device and vice versa. Thank you. Go ahead, Tom. Hi, this is Tom uh, with Comcast. So uh, we're a virtu mobile virtual network operator uh, running on Verizon's network. And, and so um, just curious on this uh, RTT to TTY capability. Um, it, is, is the gateway something that, that's in the network, or is that something that we would have to do to uh, make sure that worked on our end? Go ahead, Ian. Hi, Ian Dolner at Verizon again. Um, that's a good question. Uh, the, uh, the conversion gateway, uh, I don't know how AT&T or T-Mobile have engineered it, but uh, we have that engineered into our network so that if we um, uh, more or less don't know that the uh, other endpoint is real-time text right now, it's being converted to TTY. Uh, so that conversion point, that gateway is in our network. Uh, there's one more question, Scott. Hi, good morning. This is all really good information and uh, I've been doing some testing myself, but I did have a couple of questions. Uh, one I think would be directed towards Susan, and that is um, with the real-time text application on the AT&T network, does that then mean that with iOS uh, you're not currently supporting the built-in feature, or are you supporting both? And then my other question to everyone here, I don't know who would know, is let's say I'm on uh, I'm not able to pick up LTE my testing anyway has shown that 3G is not as reliable for RTT calls so if I were to for example place a call to 911 on Wi-Fi calling uh, as any of you who have used it on the iPhone at least as it's the only one I've used it on may know you have to give an address uh, before you can enable it for 911 Let's say I'm on uh, a network that is not the address I have registered. Do we know if when that call comes through to 911 it will show your current address or will it show the address that you have registered with Wi-Fi calling? Thank you. And this is Susan and I don't know the answers. I'm hoping maybe Christian might be able to answer that. 
And if he can't, I will go back and, and find out. Okay, this, this is Christian. This is Christian speaking. So um, I can answer the second question. Um, I think we don't know the answer yet. Um, when we've tested calls uh, 2911, the address um, does not appear. So it doesn't give their location. So we have to make people cognizant of that. So um, then the first question, I don't remember. Can someone remind me? Oh, LG versus, or I'm sorry, LTE versus uh, 3G. I don't know the answer to that. I think it works fine on Wi-Fi calling, um, and it works fine uh, on 4G, but HSPA, um, well, that works fine, too, for LTE. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, and this, this okay. is Susan oh. again. The other question was directly for AT&T in terms of supporting the built-in solution. And I first. think we don't. But I will double check. Okay. Uh, I think that there were several good questions there. This is Ian Dillner at Verizon. Um, just going to wait a moment here. There we are. Um, Ian Dillner at Verizon. Uh, a few good questions. Uh, as I understand it, uh, Verizon is the only uh, U.S. carrier that uh, has the real-time text capability uh, pushed to its devices, uh, uh, its iOS devices from Apple at this time. Um, we're, we're happy to be, uh, you know, happy to have worked with Apple and, and are uh, working with them on this, but I'm, I'm not sure that the capability was pushed to, for example, AT&T users uh, yet. Um, I, I honestly can't speak to if or when that'll happen. Um, secondly, uh, on the um, 3G question, uh, real-time text is, uh, especially the way it was mandated by the FCC um, and the 911 capabilities that were required to be rolled out uh, is very heavily incorporated into the 4G standards that, uh, that carriers and device manufacturers incorporate um, and so is not compatible with 3G networks. Uh, and so if you are on a 3G network, uh, uh, I'll verify this, but I think TTY takes over at that point. Um, certainly, as you mentioned, uh, voice if you have a device that is uh, voice over Wi-Fi enabled, uh, which as you noted, requires you to enable it uh, proactively and to enter an address, um, a call to 911, for example, will work just like a, uh, a voice call to 911. Uh, uh, so it, it follows the same uh, FCC 911 rules for uh, for address and, and, and location accuracy. Um, so um, I think I've answered, I didn't write down everything, but I think that addresses your questions, and I'd be happy to answer questions offline as well. Okay, we have time for two more questions, and we're going to end the discussion. I'm sure everybody here would make themselves available for questions later if you have more. Go ahead, Ron, and then we'll go to Sam. This is Ron Peebler speaking at the consumer. I have an iPhone 6 with Verizon as my provider. Susan, you mentioned that you can go to the Apple Store or the Google Store and download the RTT app. So you say, so that RTT app, they can be downloaded. Is that only for customers of the AT&T network? Or can that app be downloaded to any device and then you can now do RTT? My understanding is it's for um, AT&T customers. I, I really don't know if it would work otherwise. I mean, I think you can download it, but I don't know if the, you know, whatever is placed in our network is going to work from another carrier. I suspect not, but I, I don't know. I just know for AT&T customers. Okay, Sam. Hi. Hi, Sam Yale, Level Access. Uh, the FCC rules require compatibility 
of RTT implementations with RFC 4103 in order to foster interoperability between carriers. And so I'm wondering what challenges the carriers are currently facing around interoperability. Go ahead, Ian. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sam. This is Ian Dillner at Verizon. Um, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, the RTT standards incorporate uh, 4103. It's a transport layer standard for interoperability. Um, there's a lot more to interoperability, I think, than just using an RFC 4103 standard, uh, particularly the way real-time text is very heavily incorporated with uh, LT the LTE and voice over LTE standards. Um, so, uh, you know, certainly um, an RTT call will go through to any number uh, transcoded down to TTY, uh, but true RTT all the way through the network to another RTT user uh, require some advanced um, advanced levels of interconnection. Um, I know that we have that uh, with at least uh, one of the other major U.S. carriers and are working very quickly to develop that with, with others. Um, but it is more than just uh, plugging into the PSTN, which, uh, which is uh, the more basic level of interconnection uh, that works using TTY. Christian, you may have something to add. I don't know. Okay, go ahead, Christian. Okay, this is Christian speaking again. I might be able to help you out here if I give you all kind of um, an example. You're all familiar with um, VRS, I end, I'm assuming. So you all know about interoperability and the requirements therein. So you all know that it takes some time to get interoperability up and running. The technology um, that they all use um, must have the same standards, but very often the devil is in the details. And there are a lot of issues with uh, interoperability that have come up um, for these phone calls. So I'm not surprised to see that the phone companies are also confronting issues of interoperability with RTT. Um, they can be resolved. I have uh, full confidence in that, and I know that the phone companies will be able to resolve these interoperability issues uh, with, with time. So testing um, RTT for interoperability uh, is something that I'm doing. If you want to know like if you should buy AT&T, oh, I'm sorry, uh, interpreter clarification. If you're wondering about pass-through for AT&T and how that, uh, whether or not they're relying on TTY, then you have to If you see a mix of capitalized and lowercase letters, that should be a signal to you that the, it's a pass-through RTT to RTT. Um, however, if you see only capital letters, then that is another signal that probably there is a TTY conversion happening in between that, those two endpoints. Uh, Susan, go ahead. Um, this is Susan from AT&T. Christian, one of the things that I've been told from our folks is the underlying issue is whether the IP networks are compatible or not. So it's kind of like um, that's where the problem is. It's not the 4103. Does that sound like a simplified solution? Does that make sense? Or Ian, maybe. Uh, this is Christian speaking. I think that's a good question for the engineers and the network managers within each different phone carrier or phone company. Um, so I'm, there are some things that um, they're working on together, um, like call negotiation and RTT, so that both sides know that they're sending and receiving 
RTT. So that's happening. But it's, that's a, a very overview sort of answer. I hope it answers your question. Okay, I want to thank everybody. We, need, we do need to move along, but I want to thank the people who have a discussion on RTT. Okay, and thank you for your patience. We're a little behind now, so I want to introduce uh, David Schmidt, who's the TRS Fund Coordinator, and Jim Malloy, who works at MITRE, and have them have a discussion about uh, FCC research and development efforts. So good morning. Uh, my name is David Schmidt. Uh, and as uh, already mentioned, I'm the TRS Fund Program Coordinator here at the FCC. And if you want to know what that means, it's defined in the 2013 VRS Reform Order. You can go read it. Um, so I'm not going to let Jim talk this morning because he's going to talk at the Relay and Equipment uh, Subcommittee meeting this afternoon. And I'm going to elevate the conversation. We have a specific list of questions from that subcommittee, and we're going to address it there. Um, so. Uh, for those on that subcommittee, um, we'll get you your detailed response in that presentation. But for the rest of you, I wanted to give you a quick overview of what we've done uh, and what we are in the process of doing with MITRE as it relates to the research that was called for initially in the 2013 VRS reform order um, and refined in the 2014 technology transitions order and again uh, last year in the funding um, uh, order for uh, this year, this fund year. We, uh, as you recall, in the 2013 VRS reform order, one of the uh, things that the commission um, directed be done was that we were to start a research project and that that initial funding for that project was uh, $3 million. It remained as a one-time $3 million funding until this past summer uh, when um, the commission decided to move it to an annual funding um, allotment and we uh, raised the funding to six million dollars a little bit more than that annually that has allowed us to um, so the first three-year period uh, was a an opportunity to uh, establish the relationship uh, that we now have with MITRE um, and and to prove out the value that the Commission uh, would see through independent research um, into the various topics uh, that um, it considered important. So we um, initially started um, with, um, well, let's just talk about what we're doing now. So the process, um, the way this is managed is I am uh, the, the lead for management of it here at the commission um, on a day-to-day -day basis. However, uh, the decision-making process is uh, usually done by uh, much more than just me um, and uh, but the process essentially that we go through is multifaceted so a couple of key points one we've been able to establish some relationships this past year specifically uh, with Gallaudet uh, the National Technical Institute of the Deaf at RIT um, and uh, HLAA and others um, to where we've been able to include them in our research efforts um, on the inside. Um, so they now are helping define uh, the, the work that we are considering doing and are actually participating in the research uh, that, we, that we produce. So that is in partnership with our uh, friends at MITRE and is done through the MITRE contract. Um, and so that is a contractual relationship between those entities and uh, and MITRE. So that's an important uh, positive step forward. And what I want to highlight here is 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 collaboration and openness are essential. So not only are we collaborating with the Gallaudets and NTIDs, HLAAs, and others, but we're willing to collaborate with anybody. Um, and so I'm, I'm happy to talk to anyone at any point in time about any ideas that you have for research. Um, and so uh, feel free to reach out to me. We, we work on a daily basis uh, with the providers. Um, and they have 
uh, actively participated in, in a lot of the research that we, we do and are doing and are planning on doing. Um, and so it's important that everybody understand that the idea here is, is to uh, collaboratively, collaboratively uh, move the ball forward for the um, communities that are utilize TRS. Specifically, we've kind of focused our, our efforts to date in a couple of areas. First of all, if you go back to the 2013 VRS reform order, one of the key areas that that order talked about was the chronic complaining about interoperability issues, interestingly enough, just highlighted by the uh, advent of real-time text. Um, and so you will find that um, prior to 2013, we had no way to measure. Anytime there was a complaint about interoperability, it was a he said, he said, or however you want to characterize those types of arguments. Um, and, and there was no real objective entity that could look into those issues. We have set up the National Test Lab, whereby we now do testing of the equipment that is utilized in VRS and IPCTS specifically. And since we're down to a single provider of IP Relay, we have not bothered with IP Relay to be uh, um, honest and open. Uh, and we test uh, the interoperability between the providers and platforms in VRS and IPCTS on a ongoing basis. We measure the uh, certain things within IPCTS. We're looking at the accuracy, latency, and the uh, overall effectiveness of IPCTS. And we've done that through a couple of different ways. One, we have ongoing um, what, we'll, what we call device testing which uses scripts and um, um, kind of, um, how do I want to say it, um, controlled tests of, of the providers. And the reason we do it that way is because it's repeatable and you can do it on a large scale and it's easier to uh, capture the lessons learned and the, instance and the information there. We've also done usability testing, which is, more human subject testing and you get into more of the um, variability in a conversation and those kinds of things and you can um, broaden your um, test base there a little bit and how you approach the problem and how you look at the uh, functionality that's being provided. Those things have, if you, if you, if you could see my uh, slide deck here, which I, I apologize to everybody for not having a slide deck for you, but I've been out on a medical for the last two weeks, and so I did not get it in in time. Um, but what you would see is, is that we've really, with the, working with the providers, we've really gone from a situation where we've had some issues with interoperability to we have a whole lot less uh, issues with interoperability now. Um, and, and those kinds of issues, um, quite frankly, are not always the provider's fault. And I'll give you an example of how the, the whole ecosystem can be impacted. Um, back in the fall, uh, Apple, for whatever its reasons, decided that it was no longer going to support 32-bit systems and go straight to 64 only. Well, that impacted the providers because some of them use 32-bit systems. So. Um, now there's a, a process, and we're aware that this this happened, and they're aware, and we're working towards identifying the issues and resolving them. But that's a collaborative effort and not a punitive one. And so, but that had nothing to do with the providers. That was forced upon them. Um, and so, it's just elaborative of some of the uh, illustrative of some of the issues, very similar to what Christian was talking about with real time text. So that's been a, a real success story where the, it, it has also led to and, and supported efforts done by the providers um, on their own. The providers have started interoperability conferences. They do them every six months. Uh, they have invited MITRE to participate in those. MITRE is hosting the next one. Um, and so that relationship is a really positive collaborative one and we've seen a lot of uh, uh, fruitful improvement because of it. Another key thing that we've done is we've created a platform uh, based on open source technology called, which we call Ace Direct. I believe you all saw that uh, 
I don't remember if it was six months or a year ago that we presented it to the to the full DAC here. We continue to work on Ace Direct. Um, Ace Direct is a tool which allows a, the more important thing, which is direct video communications. Direct video communications is something that the commission spends a lot of time, myself and Robert McConnell from DRO and others, Karen, et cetera, uh, Susie. Um, DVC is, the, is what we're really after, okay? What we want is entities to be able to uh, afford direct communications for those with the disabilities that would um, benefit from a direct video communication. To that end, we've created the DVC platform so that we can eliminate the, oh, that's on my five to 10 year plan. Um, the technology doesn't support it. Oh, it's too difficult. Oh, it's too expensive. So by creating this platform and giving it away, um, we've eliminated uh, that argument. We are uh, in the final stages of, uh, of standing up the beta of the platform here at the FCC. We're in discussions with the IRS to stand it up at the IRS. Had a conversation with FEMA yesterday about standing it up at FEMA. The Social Security Administration is, uh, is uh, taking a look at the uh, platform for potential use at the Social Security Administration. And we've had countless conversations with others, the state of Virginia, the city of New York, um, and the list goes on and on. That is a major success story. Um, that platform has the capability um, to uh, change the way that people communicate with um, the providers of consumer services and goods. Um, and so we're very excited about it. We're very proud of it. Uh, we think the time is now. We think that, and uh, and we're finding that uh, people are starting to agree with us, and that's a, a wonderful success story. And the uh, final thing I'll talk about is um, we have some challenges in our fund, um, and not the least of which is rapid growth in IPCTS. Um, and so um, you got rapid growth in IPCTS. You have and something that this commission has. Uh, um, our council has uh, struggled with, which is how do you define uh, metrics around services? Um, and so we've been doing some work uh, in that regard as well. Um, and so um, we continue to uh, refine, um, to look at what is a meaningful communication, um, what is an effective communication, how can we make the communications more efficient? What are some new technologies that can be brought to bear to maybe do this in a different way? Um, what technologies are we not considering because we've been focused on the, the ones that, that are uh, currently approved and funded by the commission? So we don't want to be limited by the past. We want to be open to the opportunities that are, that are presented uh, as, as Again, opportunities present themselves. Real-time text is actually um, something that we've incorporated into Ace Direct. Um, and to give an idea of, of uh, how this all plays together, while we've looked at automated speech recognition, one thing that we're now uh, contemplating um, researching is, can we take automated speech recognition, turn those into captions, and then turn the captions into um, something that will present on a real-time text device and or um, a Braille reader so that now our this omni-channel Ace Direct platform that we've created uh, would now serve for the deaf as well as for uh, ASL speakers. So that's the kind of innovation that we're trying to seed. Those are the thoughts that we're trying to um, put forward and uh, trying to help uh, address the challenges um, that that we see. So the last thing I want to kind of talk about, because it always comes up, is what's the process, right? How does this work? So at a high level, the way this works is we're out there talking all the time. We have um, conversations um, that cover the gamut, and, and people bring ideas forward, and then those are taken in uh, usually to MITRE first, and MITRE meets with its partners, uh, Gallaudet, NTID, others. And, and they come up with a recommendation. 
that recommendation is then submitted to me um, and then I take it to the commission and the commission may have its own ideas on things that they want to research and we have an internal discussion on what are the proper things that we think should be the priorities and then we direct MITRE and, and, and its research partners on what exactly it is that they're authorized to go look at. Um, Martin, uh, MITRE then performs the research, they document the research and they submit it to the commission. And then the commission, uh, typically uh, MITRE will, um, when it submits its research, it'll submit it um, in two ways. It'll submit a uh, unredacted version to the commission and then it'll submit a publicly releasable version to the commission. The commission then holds the hammer on whether or not, when and how uh, we, we decide to release the results of the research. Um, so at a high level, that's kind of where we are. Um, and I shortened that a little bit because of the uh, running over earlier and I'll, I'll be quiet at this point and open it up for um, any questions that you may have. Do you want to take questions now or you want to have, you, okay, so we're opening the floor to questions. Yeah, Susan? Is there a URL that people can go to to read more about ACE Direct? So it's uh, www.fcc.gov slash ACE Direct. And if that doesn't work for you or you have open questions, david.schmidt, S-C-H-M-I-D-T, at fcc.gov. That's no my questions? email, and I'll help you out. Everett, did you have a question? No? Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Um, did you, do we have a report from MITRE as well? Oh, well, Claude now has a question. I'm sorry. Good morning, this is Claude Stout speaking. It's not really a question, more of a comment that I'd like to make. I want to commend you, David, and thank you um, for two key words that I, that I heard. Um, communication, I really look forward to discussing more with you and with Jim Malloy here this afternoon uh, during the Relay Subcommittee meeting. I want to highlight and emphasize that for deaf and hard of hearing people, we can use direct video communication services for certain purposes, but DVC may not apply to every context and every situation. So we need to work together to move towards a video relay service at a higher standard of quality and skilled services. We need to move within the IPCTS arena to a higher level of quality skilled services. We've waited too long. Uh, and we have seen improvements uh, and if in VRS, but not for a long time. We have not really seen leaps uh, in improvement there in that space. And so I, I am fine with research being done before decisions get made in terms of uh, improving IPCTS and VRS. But you do have to remember that VRS and IPCTS allows us to communicate in interactive ways with anyone, be it our family members, our neighbors, our coworkers, and even people in the government. So you have to remember when you're working with direct video communications, DVC centers, you're only working with people who are employed in those centers. That is not necessarily going to reach everybody who is outside of uh, those DVC centers. So we want, as consumers, we want full and we fully expect to be able to communicate across the board with a variety of people for a variety of reasons to have, to have the same functional equivalency as uh, hearing people. And I want to thank you, David, for your work. And I look forward to working with you and with Jim this afternoon at the Relay Subcommittee meeting. Thank you. Go ahead, David. So thank you, Claude. Um, that is an excellent point and, I, and one that I almost always make. DVC is not a end-all be-all. TRS or VRS specifically in that circumstance will always be needed. 
um, uh, until some technology comes along that, uh, along that allows it to be automated. Um, but uh, automating ASL translation is probably one of the bigger challenges, um, period. Um, so um, yes, the answer to your question is, is we are aware of that. I, I want to I give the providers uh, a little bit of uh, kudos here. We have seen the pace, and I think this is an, uh, an ancillary benefit to the research that the commission has uh, undertaken. I think the pace of innovation uh, in VRS and IPCTS is rapidly changing, specifically in IPCTS, but also in, in VRS. And the SIP transition that all the providers just went through um, or are in the process of finalizing um, has been a, uh, a, a nice uh, step forward in the quality of VRS and the uh, sustainability of quality services. Um, I would argue that um, the quality of IPCTS and the uh, options that people are investigating and the research that's going in on how to do that better is, um, is, is being undertaken by the providers as well as by the commission and by others. Uh, and we're seeing a lot more players coming into the game with a lot of innovative approaches to how you tackle these problems or these challenges and, the, and what are the options presented? And, and an exciting one and an exciting example of that is real-time text. Uh, real-time text is, a, is an exciting innovation um, uh, that, that's been brought to bear and so, or is being brought to bear. And so I, 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 I take a little bit of an exception. I, I do understand your broader point, which is we can't stop and we don't want to rest and we won't. Um, but I, you, we need to give some credit to the people that have done some good work and, and, and and brought some innovation to the game. Okay, thank you. Um, if there are no other questions. I want to thank you for coming and for your comments. So thank you. Oh, wait. Then we do have a question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Hi, this is John Card from Dish. Um, thanks very much for the information. I am not a uh, a user of most of the services I'm learning about today. I do, as, as I was sitting here listening, an odd thought crossed my mind. And Claude, you kind of sparked that when you talked about communication and metrics. And I'm wondering. I'll say this initially and see if maybe you think it's as odd as I do, and then I'll try to explain quickly. I wonder if we know we've been successful when, Claude, you get a robocall from somebody who says they want to sell you new gutters on your house, and you can understand that um, even though you didn't want to get that call, trust me, you don't want to get those calls, I will get two dozen calls before I get home. It seems as though there is an opportunity for something like the FTC's do not call registry that ought to be baked into the system fairly early on. Uh, I don't know how the do not call registry would work to interface with something like a, a direct video communication. I do think there are people that you won't want to get calls from, you'll never want to get calls from, and good luck when they decide that they're going to start targeting you for whatever services or whatever reason. I think that, um, is, is this a part of the consideration that's going on within the commission of blocking unwanted communication as well as enabling communication amongst people who want it? And if so, it, that, that's it, I'm done. Uh, Christian, did you want to respond? This is Christian speaking. So I can answer the first part only. Yes, you will get those kinds of calls. <laughs> you will get many of them. Um, but you can uh, register your VRS phone number with the registry. Um, so that's possible. But as you know, it's not, as you know, it's not very effective anymore. So the FCC has an open process to deal with that uh, challenge. 
And um, so we're trying to figure out ways to have functional equivalency, but at the same time provide that service. This is Karen. Um, in answer to your question about what the commission is doing, um, you may be aware that the policy side of the Consumer Governmental Affairs Bureau works extensively on do not call issues. But um, with respect to relay services, in 2008, the Commission set up a numbering system database for relay service users that are using IP-based forms of relay service. So as Christian points out, everyone now has a 10-digit number. And so there should be, at least for the people that are on that system, no difference, no difference in terms of being able to register your number to not get calls. So, um, and that since for now, DBC is reliant on the telephone numbers that are used within that system, it should be the same. Um, if I'm wrong in any way, we can look at further ways to ensure that consumers who use relay services have the same protections against unwanted calls as other people. Thank you. Thank you. Zainab? Yes, this is Zainab from NAD speaking. Um, to answer your question, um, I also serve as the, um, on the CAC, the Consumer Advisory Commission, and we just had a meeting this past Monday, so I, I'm here twice this week, um, but this topic came up uh, about robocalls, and um, the recommendation was voted upon. Uh, there was a friendly amendment to that, um, this all kind of happened before the meeting, but we do want to make sure that they are considering IP-based relay um, as part of the solution or as while they're considering this issue, they consider that. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, I want to thank you again for coming and, and for talking about what's going on. And now I'm going to turn it over to Karen. Thank you, Lisa. So, Elaine, we ju I just wanted to say a few words about you, and a few other people here are going to talk about your illustrious career in this field. Um, some of you may or may not know that I've actually known Elaine for 33 years. Um, I started my career in this field at the National Center for Law and the Deaf, where Elaine had already been working for, I think, around eight years. Uh, I started in 1984, so Elaine came in the 1970s. Um, at that time, just to give you a feel for how different life was, Elaine trained me on the first TTY that I ever used, which was roughly the, si the height of this table and about um, maybe two feet wide, and it was the kind of TTYs where you had to type and have yell this huge yellow paper come out with a printout, um, and the keys stuck together, and you had to press send, or you had to press shift, kind of like a, the old-fashioned typewriters. Um, so that's, that's how I started, and Elaine taught me that, and taught me, was one of the people at the National Center for Law and the Deaf, which is where we worked at Gallaudet University, um, she actually was my mentor. Um, we shared a suite of offices and uh, taught me the ropes, trained me on, um, taught me uh, t on a host of issues pertaining to access by people with, who were deaf and hard of hearing, including very basic things um, such as the right to an interpreter in hospital settings, uh, access to landlord tenant immigration. Lane and I both did legal services there actually before I think both of us turned to policy. Um, we were focused on legal services for the deaf community in the Washington, D.C. area, including the many students at Gallaudet University who seemed to have a lot of landlord-tenant issues. Um, so it was extraordinary coming into this field and having such a supportive mentor. Um, I, I will never forget how I marveled at Elaine's capabilities, her abilities to resolve issues left and right that seemed to me to be so complex. I think probably of 
all of the issues, though, the thing that impressed me the most was the huge poster on her wall of America with push pins all over the country representing the deaf prisoners who Elaine corresponded with who had been denied equal access to effective communication in their prisons. Um, these individuals had virtually been cut off from society when they were put into prison and Elaine enabled them to have a link back to society. Um, and I believe you may still have that, um, hopefully you still have that. Have she has a picture of it. Okay, in, in today's times we scan it and get a picture of it. Um, after leaving the Law Center, Elaine went to work uh, first, also, at first as an adjunct professor at Catholic University School of Law on Disability Matters, and she also went to work at the Washington Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Urban Affairs, where she continued her work on ensuring access to health care and government services, and also focused on achieving effective communication to employment, um, again, correctional facilities or uh, prisoners, prisoners effective communication and voting in addition to working on architectural barrier removal from retail and entertainment establishments and I'm really just summarizing because the list goes on and on. I don't think that there's an area of accessibility that Elaine did not have her hand hands on and approximately five years ago we were so happy um, I especially, when Elaine joined us here at the FCC, what an opportunity to be able to work with her again. In her work here, the people around this table know Elaine best as her, as the designated federal officer for the very first Disability Advisory Committee, where she carried out literally Herculean tasks every three or four months to make these meetings w move so smoothly. Um, you may have noticed, this is a minor point, but you may have noticed that we've moved from uh, bottled water to uh, cups and pitchers as, an, as a sustainability measure, but you should know that for years it was Elaine's, Elaine who purchased the bottles of water that you had out of her own pocket. Um, a small gesture, but yet representative of Elaine always wanting to make sure that uh, the people that she worked with, the people around her, uh, the people in, in, at large, were comfortable in their environment and, and their needs were attended to. Um, of course, all, all of these meetings were upwards of 60 people, as you could see, looking around the room, and it really is hot in here. Um, <laughs> it's getting hotter. Um, but nevertheless, we never had a worry because the meetings always went smoothly without a hitch but with a smile from Elaine and with lots of laughter. She, Elaine also took the lead on the Commission's first look into how the Commission could address the needs of people with cognitive disabilities, um, an area that previously had not been on the FCC's radar. In this capacity, Elaine did extensive research and led efforts to pull together industry and consumers um, and was the lead drafter on a white paper that is still, still provides significant guidance to companies that want to meet the effective communication needs of this population. While at the Commission, Elaine also worked on a host of other issues, including captioning, 911 emergency access, relay services, and hearing aid compatibility. And again, I'm just listing a few, um, because whatever and whenever we gave anything to Elaine to work on, she always approached it with alacrity and great fervor. Um, never ever saying I'm too busy. Always made time, whether it mattered, whether it meant working extra at night on the weekends. Um, uh, always the most dedicated of federal employees, but even more so the most dedicated of of individuals on these issues. Uh, Working with Elaine has undoubtedly been one of the highlights of my career, her dedication, her commitment to making sure that people with disabilities have the same access as everyone else. It's truly unparalleled. She is one of the forerunners, one of the um, uh, true founders of this whole movement. I mean, again, think back to those TTYs. Think back to the fact that when Elaine started, there was no movement. There was no there was hardly any captioning, it was just a pipe dream. There was no captioning required 
Um, there was hardly any emergency access. There really was nothing. There was a, a band of, of individuals, Elaine being one of them, at the National Center for Law and the Deaf here at Gallaudet University who took it upon themselves to build a movement, to build this whole, to build what we have here. It's because of those people, Elaine and, and Cy Dubow and Mark Sharma, Sarah Gere, um, Sheila Conlon Mankowski, the forerunners of, um, and, and truly the, uh, um, uh, the patriots, so to speak, of, of this movement that was designed to ensure effective access by people with, who are deaf and hard of hearing. Their efforts, and Elaine's especially, has resulted in significant change. Um, imp they've improved, she's improved the lives of millions of people with disabilities, and I can only describe her as selfless, kind, and empathic. I was trying to think of three words. She is the, one of the most selfless and kind and empathic people I have ever met. So Elaine, thank you so much for welcoming me to the National Center for Law and the Deaf in 1984. 33 years ago, and for teaching me um, and giving all of us the tools that we have needed to expand accessibility, and thank you for the privilege of working with you. Um, there is a poster up there, which I, hopefully you can enjoy during the lunch hour, and there's going to be more to come, um, but that has a few of the pictures from long ago, and so we hope that you enjoy them. Um, and you can see Elaine then and now, and how she has blossomed. Um, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> um, and now I'd like to turn the floor over to Claude Stout, who would also like to say a few words. And after Claude, we're going to have a couple more speakers. Thank you, Claude. This is Claude speaking. Elaine is luckier than the rest of us, I think, because uh, she retires this Friday. <laughs> I forgot to mention that. Karen covered a lot of what I wanted to say about my experience with Elaine, but I want to tender my official and formal thanks um, for all the work that you've done. As Karen explained, um, your work with the, the National Center on Law for, uh, at Gallaudet when uh, you were the president of the Disability Rights um, Advocacy Group. We have all benefited from your work. You've been out there for 30 or 35 years. You've only been here at the FCC for a, a short time, but I'd like to speak for the people that you've worked with before this. I know that they would join me in thanking you for your support and advocacy over the years. As far as your service goes on DAC, the job that you took on was tough, but you made sure that we did what we were supposed to do and that we fulfilled our function. And having the voices of all the stakeholders present, making sure that the commission was satisfied with the running of the group and as well as meeting our expectations and needs. You were often uh, kind of between a rock and a hard place, I think, um, and we deeply appreciate and acknowledge that that work. I was privileged to work with you as a co-chair back in the day, and I want to just thank you for all of the hard work. And I hope and that you have a wonderful, wonderful retirement starting this Friday. And now um, I'd like to call on Maggie Negrin. Negrin. Good morning. Uh, I'm Maggie Nigren, and I am just really delighted to be able to say a few words about the very fabulous Elaine Gardner. Um, Elaine coordinated the DAC since its inception, riding herd over the many 
many committees, <laughs> subcommittees, and working groups, not to mention complying with all the regulations and policies related to a FACA committee of the FCC. I had the honor of serving on the last iteration of the DAC and the privilege of working with Elaine as she provided leadership to a number of important initiatives. She successfully spearheaded an initiative that ultimately resulted in a cognitive disability summit that was held in October of 2015. And any of you who've organized a summit know how much work that is. She uh, organized this event. She brought together speakers from a number of federal agencies, leading researchers and thought leaders in accessible technology. Um, the, the, the meeting informed, I think, the further work of the FCC on improving communications technologies for independent living, emergency preparedness, ensuring um, funding access to, ensuring and funding access to equipment, training, and broadband. Also, uh, under her guidance and with uh, committee co-chairs Susan Masrui and Matt Gerst, the Cognitive Disabilities Working Group produced a white paper that was referenced earlier addressing access to information and communications technologies by people with cognitive disabilities. Um, saying that someone helped develop a white paper sounds really short. It's months and months of riding herd over cats running in different directions. Um, not, not to be uh, stopped there, she also guided the development of an accompanying document um, with the great title, Best Practices to Promote Effective Access to Usability of Information and Communication Technology Products and Services for Americans with Cognitive Disabilities. I had to write that all out. Um, it was approved by the DAC uh, in September of 2016, and both those documents are still available on the FCC website. I know because I checked. So I hope everyone does take an opportunity to check them out. Elaine, I really want to thank you for the important work that you've done with the DAC. Your leadership has been uh, crucial, not only for the DAC's success in informing the Disability Rights Office, of the FCC, um, but for your work benefiting the lives of people with disabilities. And I really do wish you the best as you tackle your next set of challenges. And I, I get to have the last word here, and I know I'm between you and lunch, so I'm going to make my report, my remarks a little brief. Um, as the current co-chair representing Sam and both Sam and I, uh, we wanted to say how pleased we have been to be able to, to work with you and to have a couple of moments to say our words of appreciation for working with you. Elaine has done so much for people with disabilities for so long that her role as designated federal officer for the DAC is simply a grace note in a long and illustrious career. It has been a pleasure working with Elaine this year. She is a wonderful resource. She's been thoughtful, helpful, and respectful of all our questions and all our concerns about the running of the DAC. So we salute Elaine, and we wish her a very, very happy, healthy, and all around terrific retirement. Thank you, Thank you Elaine. You well, you want I I was uh, you know, I have Tim has his hand up. Can we have a couple of minutes for Tim? Well, just just I, I wanted ahead. to mention something really important. Um, so we're going to be breaking for lunch, but at two o'clock, make sure you're here because we will have a cake for Elaine. <laughs> so we wanted to make sure that you save some room after lunch. The cake the cake is coming a little bit later. So okay, and Tim, you had a point sure. something you wanted to say. Tim Craig and the Access Board. I just wanted to join the long list of people, and I want to brag a little bit that my personal connection with Elaine goes back 35 years. I was a law student at Catholic University of America, Columbus School of Law, and I took the elective law clinic course, Law and the Deaf. And I have to say, back at that time, there was no ADA. There were no accommodations. 
As a law student, my accommodations were pivot and turn every time, in every time someone in class spoke up. I got a lot of aerobic exercise. I was really toned, let me tell you. When I got to Gallaudet, I met Elaine, and she introduced me to a world that I didn't know existed. I was a mainstreamed, hard of hearing individual who'd always been told, don't make a big deal about your disability. Don't let anybody see your hearing it. Please, you know, don't mumble. You don't have a hearing loss, you're just not paying attention. All of that is the kind of thing, as an individual with a disability, that's absolutely what it was. Elaine was one of the first people in my life to say to me, this is the real thing, and there are laws that can address these concerns. No question was too stupid. No issue was too minor. Elaine was generous, she was caring, she was thoughtful. She introduced me to an entire world that I didn't know existed. After that semester was over, you know, I went back to the regular law school routine and then I went on to a practice doing litigation in court. And when I was in court, there again, there were no accommodations, okay? So I was there for myself and I just had to listen. And if I didn't hear something, I would ask people to repeat. But I knew, thanks to people like Elaine, that it wasn't something to be ashamed of. I was standing up for my rights and the rights of my clients. And I actually had an instance in court one time, and I'll mention this story because this is the kind of thinking that I got from Elaine, which was to lay your case and know your fact pattern, and you can overcome and address inequities. I was in court on a hearing on a motion. And opposing counsel's defense was, oh, this is predicated on a discussion that Mr. Cregan and I had, and he, he misunderstood me. I, I'm afraid, and here this hypocrite choked up and pretended to be sorry for, I'm afraid he didn't hear me. I'm afraid he misunderstood what I said. And the judge was like ready to blow up at this guy. And I said, Your Honor, you know, again, channeling your lane, calm, rational, pleasant. May I address that issue, please? And she said, yes, Ms. Cregan. I said, okay, Your Honor, so the incident he's talking about was the communication on such and such a date and time. I'd like to introduce Exhibit A, and I said, this is a letter that I sent to opposing counsel on the date in question. The letter memorializing our conversation in the terms of it and telling him to contact me if he did not understand it or if he did not disagree. Here is the self-addressed stamped return envelope. Here is the receipt of the fax and the fax number on this corresponds to the correspondence on his letterhead. I've never heard any contradictions from counsel until this very moment. At that point, the judge turned to opposing counsel and said, sir, oh, <coughs> she said, judgment for Mr. Cregan. So, I would like to say the judgment for people like Elaine who reach out in ways large and small makes a huge difference. And what I want to say, speaking personally for me, that I think you really embody the principle of passing on. So the help you've given, the support you've given, the assistance and the hard work, I'm going to remember that myself, and I'm going to try to pass it on, and I'm going to try to inspire people like you inspired me. Thank you. We, we, we can't end on a better note than that. Thank you so much. I hope you all have a wonderful lunch, and we'll see you afterwards. Did you want them to come back at a certain um, time? One o'clock. Um, we're going to come back at 1 o'clock. We have a full agenda in the afternoon, so eat with do speed and come back here ready to work. Thank you. All right, folks, if we could start moseying towards our seats, please.
Please take your seats. Welcome back, everybody. This is Sam Yale from Level Access. Hope everyone had a great lunch. And once again, I would like to thank CTIA, uh, Matt Gerst, Kara Graves, for keeping us all nourished and keeping our blood sugar high. All right, so we are going to revisit the recommendation from the Video Programming Subcommittee concerning uh, providing a five-year uh, waiver for uh, converting dynamic images for non-news programming into audio speech for the blind and visually impaired. Uh, currently, we have a proposal from Helena to lower the uh, exemption period from five years to three years. So here's how we're going to take this up. We're cu currently going to open discussion on the amendment alone. And then I will call for a motion to vote on the amendment itself, just the amendment. And if we get a second on that motion, then we will vote strictly on whether or not to adopt the amendment. Whether that vote passes or fails, we will then have a second vote on the recommendation from the video programming subcommittee. So with that being said, I would now like to open the floor for any final discussion concerning Helena's proposed amendment. Um, Helena. Helena, you have the floor. Thanks, I really appreciate that. I want to start out by saying we really appreciate the hard work of the subcommittee and what you've done. I know you've been working on it for the last year, and that's important. But because you're asking for a vote, I think the importance of this topic is very critical, and we really need to take the time to look at it from the perspective of the end user. I'm not convinced that it can't be done more efficiently and timely, particularly regarding static images. The broadcast industry might be really concerned with accessibility, but most of us know it's probably not among their top priorities. But in emergencies, it is among top priorities for people with disabilities to receive as much information as possible in modalities that offer redundancy and timeliness, to alleviate higher incidents of injuries and fatalities. And we know this based on the surveys, which we do every other year of over 14 to 1,500, 1,600 sometimes, people with disabilities and what they care about emergency communications, and over 50 focus groups and the feedback that they give us on these issues which are critical to their well-being. Still, uh, I recommend a shorter window, but I'd like to amend my own amendment and go from three years to four years, which is a split between the two, because I think that there's some aspects of this that can be on a little bit faster timeline, that can bring differences. And it matters most, not so much to the industry, but ultimately on impacting the lives of people with disabilities during emergencies. So I amend my amendment to say uh, from three to four years, and one year may not seem like a big deal, but I still think it is because it's critical to the lives of people during all these massive natural disasters and s some uh, human-made disasters we've been having. All right, Tony, you're next. And I, I think 
Tony Stevens with ACB. And uh, I'm, I think Larry wanted to say something just real quick, and then I'll jump in. Thank you. Uh, just two quick things in response to Helena. Um, first, um, of course, the, the goal is to provide accurate, audible description of emergencies for the benefit of the public safety of people. That's what that's the, one of the main things that broadcasters do. Um, the second point is that um, you said that uh, the <clears throat> we could accomplish this task. You believe we could accomplish this task much faster than five years if a shorter deadline was imposed, uh, particularly for static images. Static images are not the subject of the proposal. Broadcasters already orally describe in text crawls static images. We are only talking about when a moving dynamic graphic map or something like that is put up during during a uh, during a non-news programming when an emergency happens. Um, we're not talking about static images. We're already doing that. We've already been doing that since the FCC uh, imposed this rule years ago. Thank you. All right, Tony. Thank you. Um, Tony with ACB. Uh, you know, I, I'm thinking back to our, our Florida Council of the Blind in Florida, which is one of our largest affiliates. During Hurricane Irma, uh, you know, when we reached out to them asking for feedback around how they felt emergency response was, particularly around uh, the broadcast side, uh, the one complaint we heard was that uh, over and over again, it wasn't the only complaint, but the one that sort of rose to the surface was, and this was an issue they said that was the curb cut phenomenon, that it impacted really a lot more people than just people who are blind. Power was lost, so everyone went to their radio, either in their cars or on transistor radios, and radio stations were, were passing through the television because they had, the TV networks had the much more robust weather department, you know, weather gang or crew, whatever they, you know, call themselves to, uh, in, in news operations. A uh, team, thank you. The weather team. Uh, and essentially, you know, there was the concern that it wasn't being described well enough. Uh, and this was an issue that wasn't just impacting people who are blind, but it was impacting all people. Um, ACB feels in this recommendation, uh, in, in the waiver, it's allowing to move for a distraction, or away from a distraction, we feel. Uh, I think it's mentioned in one point in one of the whereas clauses. Um, you know, in a sense of uh, trying to find um, a technical solution, yes, there are technical solutions that like you mentioned with graphic images, there are things that can be done. Um, but within the legacy systems as they stand now, even with four years, um, even with five years, it might not be done yet. But it allows us to move more into, uh, you know, a newer way to distribute programming through televisions where things like APIs that can be these solutions to do a dynamic image. Because even in a sense of the video feeds as they're being pushed out now, a static image as you're seeing it on your screen is still a refreshed image over and over again. So essentially it's a video. And in that sense, with the technical hurdles, um, we felt that five in the sense of the compromise, because we talked about this in, in length in the subcommittee meeting. Uh, you know, we talked about three, we talked about zero. I think at one point even four might have been mentioned. Uh, you know, but that again was starting from nothing and then to seven. I mean, nothing in the sense of having it completely rescinded. Uh, so we still, at, at ACB, I feel like five is a good compromise with the understanding that we are already moving now, today, towards, you know, working with industry to better train journalists to know how to better describe in those situations like our members in Florida had during Hurricane Irma and other people that weren't just blind, but other people that were listening into the television via their radios and not being able to see it themselves. All right, next is Tom. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. Uh, this is Tom with Comcast. I think there's really two different threads that we need to consider in all of this. One is the technology <clears throat> itself. And even if we were to do some proof of concept of the ability to dynamically insert these descriptions, it's going to be proof of concept, not yet commercialized. And, you know, uh, that's going to take time. You know, we're, we're probably you know, uh, a good chunk of time away from a, a meaningful prototype of dynamically inserting these these uh, 
types of uh, uh, text uh, into this. You also have to think about emergencies just don't happen at 6 or 7 or 8 p.m. when you might be able to grab a describer. Um, they happen at 2, 3, 4 in the morning. And, you know, we're not to a point where we can automate this yet, right? So the, the current description technology that's out there that people continue to point to is uh, what, you know, the Facebook team developed to essentially describe photos that people post on their Facebook feed. And even there, uh, they're giving you some very generic descriptions. You know, a, a photo of two people standing against a tree, you know, a blue sky above, or whatever it might say. I'm just making that up. That is pretty generic. Uh, and so what you might get in an emergency today would be, you know, the funnel-shaped cloud moves across the screen. That's not good enough for someone who's blind or visually impaired to make any meaningful uh, decision. Where, where the text, though, comes into play is the crawl, where the text that's being visually displayed while that image may be represented is saying, you know, a tornado uh, warning for X county. That's what's being spoken already. That text is already there. So I think we've got to look at this from two different ways. One is the technology that we need at the broadcast level to dynamically insert these descriptions. The second piece that we need to look at is how are these descriptions being created themselves? And there is, in the course of the discussions that we've had on this topic over the past year plus that I've been involved with it at least, debate even amongst the consumer community as to the value of these extra descriptions uh, in emergency information. So I think there's we need more time to sort all of this out uh, from both both sides of the equation here. And so rather than kind of rush into something and think we're going to have the right solution, uh, let's, let's take the time, allow ACB, NAB, AFB, NFB, anyone else who's interested, RERCs, whomever, to really galvanize around some of these two threads of technology issues and content uh, issues to really find the way forward. I just don't feel like we have enough information today to say, you know, within, you know, uh, three, four years that we'll be in a position to be able to, you know, put something out there. Everett, you're next. Oh, I got to get you this. Hold on. I'm not going to go uh, forward with any lengthy um, dramatic thing, but I, I just wanted to say that in our subcommittee meetings, it was told to us um, that the FCC typically looks at a three-year window, and and so that's that's why um, the the National Federation of the Blind is is sticking with the three-year. Um, in in what we would we would recommend and why we would like to see it moved to three years. So um, the FCC typically looks at that, and so uh, I realize that that uh, what what Tony and Tom have eloquently said, and Larry as well, and and appreciate their responses. And so we were sticking with that because that's what the FCC usually recommends is a three year uh, waiver period. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? Uh, Brian? Hi, everyone. Is the camera on me yet? There we go. <laughs> Brian Unashko speaking. I don't know a lot about this issue, admittedly, but I think Tom brought up a point about um, when there are emergency alerts and there's not enough usable information for a blind consumer. And I would say that uh, when I was in California last fall, uh, I was unfortunately in the middle of the wildfires um, and the alarm went out and I got an alarm on my phone that, that there was an alert that I needed to evacuate immediately. And it said, monitor media, you know, like for further information. Well, that was useless for me uh, and for other deafblind people in the same situation. So I have more of a general question, I guess, regarding this discussion. 
which is, are you considering the deaf-blind community and the impact uh, of, the, of their situation when you're having these conversations? Tony, would you like to respond to that? Yes. Yes, Tony with ACB. A, a really good question, Brian. And, you know, from ACB's perspective, yes. And we understand there is a greater need to get greater information to people that have sensory disability. Uh, we, we've had good conversations this morning around RTT and other ways that we communication can be set up in an emergency that is fully accessible. ACB believes that there is a solution that's out there. Uh, it's, it's not available on an app store now today. We know not everybody has smartphones. It's not readily available in a sense. Um, but there are ways that, that, you know, we can definitely improve the overall emergency alert system across media. And that's the key, multiple media. Tom had mentioned, you know, if it's not getting what a person who's blind needs, then I'll go turn on, let's say, NOAA Weather Radio. Do we have other ways to get text messages? Is there another way to get that information in, a, in the most critical manner? Uh, and I believe, yes, there is. We need to work at honing in on that as part of this conversation, which is why I don't want, from our bandwidth at ACB at least, where we, we have limited resources, I don't want to be bogged down um, uh, because of a <clears throat> you know, essentially a three-year rush to try to find a solution that, that once legacy systems get pushed out, well, that thing is kind of old, passe, horse and carriage type thing. Um, I believe we can look toward the future. We can find technologies to create accessible emergency alerts through some sort of media, like when you get that text that says, tune into your local media, um, such that we can find ways to better in improve the safety of people who are blind and deaf blind and have other sensory disabilities and other cognitive disabilities in our community so that they can get the information they need, digest it, and understand it. Okay, uh, Larry, Larry, did you have a response? No, not a response to Tony. Okay. Just uh, a quick point of reference um, to, to Everett's point and Elena's point about possibly using four years or three years. Um, I'm not sure what context you're referring to that the FCC usually uses three years for things. Um, sometimes, they, sometimes they delay rules for six months. Sometimes they rescind rules entirely that don't make sense anymore. So I'm not sure what context. Um, I guess I would just ask the committee to uh, consider and possibly defer to the advice from people like Tony and, and other folks who have spent a lot of time on the issue and explored the potential for a technical, solu technical solution coming and uh, when that might arrive. Thank you. Ron, you're next. Thanks, Ron Beacon. And um, Larry just hit the nail on the head what I was about to say. I was on the subcommittee with the group. And so emergency quality description is way beyond my pay grade. It's not something that I'm involved with because I'm deaf, so I don't need the emergency quality description. But I watched these guys talk, and we were trying to come up with an actionable recommendation. If the subcommittee had presented, had come up with a recommendation for three years, it would not have got out of the subcommittee. There was not enough support for it. So as a compromise, we came up with a five-year recommendation. And so I just, and I highly, highly um, respect what Tom and Tony have to say. They're the experts. They were coming with five years, and they're also consumers. And I was surprised they were willing to modify, compromise, and come up with five years. It was a surprise to me. And so I would support that. As the motion to amend it to three or four years goes around, I can't really do anything on that motion. I would have to abstain. But whatever the final motion is, I'm going to support. But like Larry said, I think the subcommittee worked really hard on that. The reason they came up with five years, that's how it came out of the subcommittee, and I would recommend that we support the subcommittee's recommendation. All right, Scott, you're next. Hi, this is Scott speaking. I don't think the technology in the sense that we're talking with it being all automated is out there, but there's a sort of hybrid model. And if you look at what 
NOAA has done when they issue warnings, uh, the way they issue them is uh, they put points on a map and it will alert people within the points between those two locations uh, and it generates a bunch of text based on that information. The text is a bit verbose sometimes, but it's there. And I kind of feel like that's the route that we should look at going with this. And if that's the case, would it really take five years to um, do that? The other thing for me is, yeah, okay, I'd like it in three years. I would have liked it six, uh, almost six years ago when I was in Hurricane Sandy and I was not aware I was supposed to evacuate. But these things do take time. Um, so I'm a little torn on this issue. Would I like it done today? Absolutely. Is it going to get done today? No. Will it get done in three years? I don't know. But I think within three years we can certainly make a lot of progress as long as we keep pushing things and keep researching. Thank you. All right. I'd like to wrap up the discussion. Tony, did you have a final response or is your car just left up? Tony. Yeah, yes, it was left up. I apologize. But just in, in terms of, Scott, your comment, um, I mean, that those are situations, I mean, this group does not, I would love to be able to guide the hand of FEMA and NOAA as well. Uh, and by all means, we, we have reached out to them in the past and, and will continue to, uh, as well as to offering feedback to the, to the commission as well uh, when they've sought requests for information on emergency alerts in all capacities. Um, I, I think the solution is, uh, is, of, is there are solutions to make it better and safer so that you're not stranded in Sandy again like that. Um, but I think in terms of that solution coming in a four-year or three-year time frame, uh, or, or who knows if five years even, you know, that was a number we, we felt was most comfortable with transition and compromise. Um, but in that sense, in a legacy system uh, that, that we're having difficulty in trying to find a workable solution based on the current existing technology and five years, ten years down the road technology where technologists are thinking uh, is, is just not here. So, you know, I mean, ACB stands committed to finding that, but I think it's a conversation outside of, of what we were asked to do in putting together this particular recommendation, which I still feel has some very positive gains when we move towards the work that's already starting and ramping up towards better educating journalists that would be covered under 79.21. Thank you all. At this time, I'm going to close discussion, and I'm going to call for a motion to vote on the amendment uh, to change the recommendation to four years. Do we have a motion to vote on the amendment? Okay, Brian moves. Do we have a second? Uh, Helena. <laughs> All right, Helena seconds. At this time, we are going to call for the vote on the amendment to change the recommendation from five years to four years. No, we're... we're so, we'll just start at the... Um, who's at the end of the table? Yeah, start there. With who? I don't know. Okay. Wait, he's, he's going to say we had his hand up. Well, no, the discussion period, the discussion period is, the, 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 the oh, is there, there's a question about the vote. What's the question? If the vote on the amendment fails, do we then vote on the original recommendation right after? Yes, we'll call for a, sec, a separate vote for okay. the original Thank recommendation. Thank you. All right, so we're, we are now voting on the amendment. Okay, Phyllis Ginevan for AUCD votes no. Maggie Nigren, AAIDD, no. Brian Scarpelli with ACT the App Association defer to the subcommittee's deliberations and vote no. Everett ba Bacon, National Federation of the Blind votes no. Tom Litkowski, Comcast votes no. Susan Mazarui, AT&T, votes no. Jerry Barrier, Perkins School for the Blind, votes no. Scott Davert, Helen Keller National Center, votes no. Stephanie Cool, Stephanie Cool, NCTA, opposes the amendment. 
Larry Rock, NAB, votes no. Tony Stevens with ACB respecting Helena's intent, but, but will vote no. Tim Cregan, you're a factless board abstain. Helena Mitchell votes yes. Well, people to consumer abstain. Gary Beam from RIT and TID voting no. Christian Vogler from Gallaudet University respectfully voting no. Zainab al Kepsi, National Association of the Deaf, with respect to the blind community and their vote, also voting no. Claude Stout from TDI, voting no. Musi Gerber, abstaining. Eddie Martinez from TCSA. TCS Associates, uh, voting no. Brian, deafblind advocate, voting no. Ian, <clears throat> Ian Dillner, Verizon, voting no. Rachel Nemeth, CTA, voting no. Maria Kirby, Apple, voting no. Matt Gerst with CTIA, votes no. Maria Diaz de Capta, votes no. John Cardish Network, no. That's everyone you. Sam, <coughs> Sam Yale, level access, votes no. Lisa Hamlin, Hearing Loss Association of America, no. The amendment fails. Next, I would like to call for a motion to vote on the original recommendation from the Video Programming Subcommittee for the five-year waiver. Do we, I have a motion to vote on the original recommendation? Before you get that point, point from Brian Unashko, Sam. Brian, go ahead. Can we repeat the phrasing of the original uh, language and give us a moment to um, perhaps have a, an opportunity to make additions before we go ahead with the vote? Uh, I, I, at this time, I, I don't think so. I, I think we'd like to call the question for the original amendment. Uh, the, the, recommenda the recommendation was sent out before. Do you, do you have access to it? This is Brian speaking. Yes. Okay. Uh, I just think that it might that it's appropriate in procedure because we have had a number of breaks and we broke for lunch and so forth to have a chance to know exactly what it is that we're voting for by repeating the language of the original um, recommendation before we vote on it. Understood. In the interest of time, I would uh, request that people review the language of the recommendation as as written and sent out. Do I have a motion to vote on the original recommendation from the Video Programming Subcommittee? Motion. Yes. Okay, motion. Uh, Larry moves. Do I have a second? second. <laughs> Tom. Tom seconds. Yeah. All right, so I call the original recommendation from the Video Programming Subcommittee to the question for a vote. So a question, so you're saying there's no more discussion? At, at this point, no. We're calling for a vote on the original recommendation. Okay. okay. Phyllis Ginneman for AUCD, yes. Maggie Nigren, AAIDD, yes. Brian Scarpelli, ACT, the App Association, voting yes. Everett Bacon, National Federation of the Blind, votes no. Tom Litkowski, Comcast, votes yes. <clears throat> so 
Susan Masrui, 18T, votes yes. Jerry Barrier, Perkins School for the Blind, votes yes. Scott Davert, Helen Keller National Center, votes yes. Stephanie Cool, NCTA, votes yes. Larry Walk, NAB, votes yes. Tony Stevens, ACB, votes yes. Tim Cregan, U.S. Access Board, abstain. Helena Mitchell, Wireless, RERC, votes no. Juan Pipler, Consumer, votes yes. Gary Beam from RIT and TID, votes yes. Christian Vogler from Gallaudet University, abstaining. National Association of the Deaf, abstaining. Claude Stout from TDI, votes yes. Mosi Geber abstaining. TCSA votes yes. Brian Unashko, deafblind advocate, abstains. Ian Dillner with Verizon votes yes. Rachel Nemeth with CTA votes yes. Maria Kirby with Apple votes yes. Matt Gers with CTIA votes yes. Maria Diaz from Dicapta abstain. John Card Dish Network yes. Sam Yale Level Access votes yes. Lisa Hamlin HLAA votes yes. You have a majority. We do have a majority vote, so the recommendation passes. All right. Uh, Tom, did you did you ha have a uh, a point for discussion? So uh, we kind of got derailed with the video subcommittee report. We never got to Ron's uh, quick report on the uh, caption and description transmittal working group, uh, so can we just wrap the rest of the video subcommittee report here in, in the two or three minutes that Ron needs for his report? Yes, uh, video programming subcommittee can finish their report, so go ahead, Ron. Thank you. At Time we have, thank you. At Time we have a new captions and description transmission working group, and um, we've been meeting, and Heather it's going, Heather York is going to give a report on our behalf. It's going to be very quick. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Got it? This one? We're good? All right. So I'm here to update you on the captions and descriptions transmittal working group, or CDTWG, a new subgroup under the video programming subcommittee. Our task first is kind of long, but here's what we have from the FCC. Identify issues associated with the transfer of captioning and video description files among video programming providers and distributors to advise the Commission on how it can best support efforts to assure that captions and video description are seamlessly delivered when video programming is transferred from one producer, distributor, or rights holder to another, regardless of distribution platform, which is a mouthful, but it basically means figure out how to get captions from one site to another. We've had three meetings. We first refined our scope to content that is captioned or described on TV and content owner sites and subsequently syndicated to other distributors, also referred to as third-party platforms. To clarify, we're not looking at unauthorized uses of video, nor are we advocating for new rules. We defined our audience as the people who technically facilitate the creation and distribution of video via TV and IP, which had previously been captioned or audio described. We drafted use cases detailing the successful and unsuccessful transfer of accessible media files across platforms. 
For instance, the Tonight Show we found captions most of their video on Facebooks where other late night talk shows do not. We have documented instances of this occurring on Twitter and Facebook and other third party platforms. And we want to learn from successful use cases and others. We're now in the discovery portion of our endeavor and as such have outlined questions that we'd like to ask subject matter experts and key stakeholders. Specifically for content owners or creators, we want to know when you license or syndicate content you create or own, how do you provide captions and descriptions to your licensing partners? If you do not provide the associated files, what are the barriers to doing so? For content distributors, when you receive licensed content from other providers, do you receive captions and or descriptions for that content? If so, how, and if not, what are the barriers? I'm, I think we've come to the point where we realize there are significant barriers for a lot of this. After today's meeting, the subgroup will meet with Facebook, which has 3.8 billion daily video views. 85% of the video on the platform is said to be viewed without sound. Some Facebook pages, including the new Facebook Watch shows with Tom Brady, in case you all watch that, um, are captioning and successfully display recently captioned content. Some do not. We hope to learn more about the company's approach to accessible media. We'll continue our discovery through the upcoming months, and our ultimate goal is to produce a guide that will help program providers share accessible content across platforms, whether or not it's required. That was short. Anything else? Thank you, Ron and Heather, for that report. Are there any questions for the video programming subcommittee? Christian, Christian go ahead. Just waiting for the camera. There we go. This is Christian Vogler speaking. Uh, related to Facebook, um, I did notice a lot of videos are captioned. Uh, however, most of them are op open captioned rather than closed captioned. Um, that means that there are some challenges for individuals who are low vision uh, or people who are deaf blind. Uh, are there any plans for working with Facebook or potentially uh, better educating them uh, how to use captions appropriately? Heather or Ron? This is Heather. Heather, go ahead. Hello. We hope to get answers to that this afternoon. Um, we have I have a whole list of questions, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll get back. Let me get back to you on that one, Christian. Any other questions for the video programming subcommittee? All right, before the uh, relay and equipment distribution subcommittee gives their report, I would like to invite Elliot Greenwald to uh, talk to us about the recent report and order issued by the FCC about TRS. Uh, good afternoon, this is um, Elliot Greenwald, uh, Disability Rights Office here at the FCC. Um, as I mentioned to you this morning, uh, the FCC did release shortly after I gave my report this morning uh, the, an, an order regarding the uh, t you know, TRS user, U URD you know, um, and the uh, user registration database. And the FCC extend, you know, and, and this was uh, by delegate authority, the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau and the Office of Managing Director. Uh, and uh, they granted a 31-day extension, that would be till March 31st, um, to enter existing uh, users into the uh, user registration database. Um, so the providers now have until March 31st. Uh, the order also clarified um, that for users who are where their data is entered by the deadline but they are still being processed by the user registration database which is a multi-step process um, if they're not accepted on the first uh, go around and there's an opportunity opportunity to resubmit and to provide further information that basically uh, as um, if that process is ongoing for up to 60 days uh, the providers can uh, still continue to provide service to those users while that process is undergoing uh, and the minutes will be compensable if the user is ultimately um, found to be um, uh, um, eligible 
to uh, to receive um, you know video relay service. Um, if the user is ultimately found not to be eligible, then the minutes would be non-compensable. And after 60 days, um, if the process is still ongoing, but the user is ultimately found to be eligible, those minutes will be compensable at, a, at that later time. Um, so uh, any questions? Brian. Brian, go ahead. All right. Um, this is Brian speaking. I'm uh, happy that companies are providing software for deafblind individuals to access relay services. Uh, that said, uh, I'm working with a variety of VRS companies uh, to understand the URD screening process. Uh, seems to be a fairly complicated endeavor. Uh, there are m a number of issues that have arisen, and uh, one particular problem uh, related to the URD system is the requirement that we send in information uh, prior to uh, prior to 11 a.m. Uh, and if the information is sent within this specific window of time during the day, uh, then it will be accepted. Uh, for some individuals, uh, that process is very lengthy. Uh, and for those involved with the National Deafblind Equipment Distribution Program, um, that's uh, an additional factor for deafblind individuals uh, to be able to uh, approve their identity and submit their documentation. Um, and I think that the FCC should provide trainers for deafblind individuals um, and understanding that the URD process is, is not perfect and that there will be uh, adjustments that need to be made. Um, it seems as though the URD is costing the FCC an insurmount insurmountable amount of money and uh, there needs to be some way for deafblind individuals who do qualify for services and are already in the system uh, that should be sufficient validation for the URD. Karen, go ahead. Thanks, Brian. This is Karen Strauss. Um, the uh, commission in 2013 made a decision that it would be best to curb that one good way of curbing fraud and abuse in the video relay program, which had been subject to extreme fraud and abuse, would be to ensure that the identity of users was ver would be verified. They, up until now, there has been no such requirement. Individuals have had to register, but there was no verification requirement. And that's why you're having to do what you have to do now. However, the added time will, in effect, provide an additional 90 days from beginning to end. That should be ho what we're hoping will be enough time to get additional users basic data into the system and then any supplemental data that's needed. If an individual has, a, if an individual's identity is not verified by, by that time, there are appeal processes. We'll look at each case individually. Um, this is the first time that I'm learning of a specific problem affecting people who are deafblind. So um, we may want to touch base with you and learn a little bit more about this. One thing that I can tell you, you said that you had to get the information in by a certain time each day. For a very long time, the data processing was only being taking, taking place on, um, at certain specific, specific times. Now the data processing is occurring hourly. I don't know if that makes a difference for the, your specific needs or the specific needs of the deafblind community. But um, we should probably take this offline and talk more. Um, we're just hoping that the extended deadline does allow for additional opportunity to rectify any um, problems that are occurring with the identity checks. 
Any other questions about the t new TRS rules? Christian, go ahead. Christian Vogler speaking. Uh, this is more of a broad comment. I understand about the URD and I do have some concerns about the requirements of verification for all calls. Uh, you know, what I understand is that uh, the verification has to happen within a certain time frame. Uh, and that has to happen in real time. Uh, and I understand that some individuals are failing their verification. When, this is Karen. When, when you say real time. So, hold on one second, Karen. We're okay. So when there's signal, uh, a single point failure. Uh, so I do have concerns about single point failures occurring. Uh, so if the system goes down, how will VRS providers manage that situation? And then secondly, how will we be able to commit that that information that's been verified uh, is the verification is happening in real time to avoid any kind of data loss if the system were to go down? Uh, and I understand that's an engineering feat and it's not no simple task, but I did want to mention that. Okay, so this is Karen, and I think that perhaps there are two different parts of our verification and validation efforts that are being conflated in your question. Um, the verification doesn't have to happen in real time. I mean, it, it would be nice if it did, but it goes through an automated check. If it fails for some reason, for example, not all of the identifying information matches up, this, it can be run through the system again with additional data, or sometimes it's just a formatting problem. And so there are various, as, as Elliot mentioned, there are actually multiple steps that you can take to make that verification happen, whether it's providing more data or just rerunning it through a different way, providing the data input a different way, et cetera. And then there are also um, manual, you can be done manually by the people on site as well as automated in an automated fashion. Um, it sounded to me like what you were also alluding to is the validation which is that when a person tries to make a phone call, the provider will have to validate, make sure that the individual who's making the call has had his or her identity verified. That component of the user registration database is not taking place right now. It is, it, it is not set up, it is not being enforced, I should say. It's, it's, some of it is available, but it is not being implemented in full at this point. We will notify the public when that part goes goes to full implementation. So that is a raises other technical questions, again, which I suggest that we take offline, but we are still working out the kinks on that. Thank you, Karen. At this time, I'd like to move on to the Relay and Equipment Distribution Subcommittee Report. So I'd like to turn it over to Rochelle and Pam. Thank you, Sam. This is Rochelle Garrow, um, co-chair of the Relay and Equipment Distribution Subcommittee. Um, Pam Holmes was not able to join us today. Um, so our subgroup, or our subcommittee has two work groups right now, uh, VRS, VRS Metrics work group. Um, this uh, group is working on an issues paper listing the challenges and opportunities for improving VRS interpreting. In March, they're meeting with Dr. Marty Taylor to learn about her work developing video interpreting benchmarks for the Canadian Administrator of VRS. The group also discussed creating a survey and sending it out to interpreters, asking where they feel they need training and what their frustrations are working as VRS interpreters. 
The group's looking into the feasibility and practicality of discussing VRS metrics at the VRS interoperability meeting um, to tap into that group's expertise. Our other work group is IPCTS metrics. Um, and as you heard earlier, MITRE will be presenting to our subcommittee after the DAC meeting today. Um, the IPCTS metrics work group came up with a list of items, um, a long list of items that it wanted MITRE to include in their presentation, time permitting, and uh, including um, information on their subcontracts with Gallaudet and RIT, uh, an update of MITRE phase three testing, clarification on MITRE's testing protocols, and the plans um, for a phase four. Uh, at the last IPCTS metrics work group meeting, members, ex uh, members expressed concern um, that we're not making good progress. Uh, members felt that the group is too focused on the testing that MITRE is or is not doing and the results of that testing and not on moving forward with determining recommendations for basic IPCTS standards independent of MITRE research. Uh, the members suggested that we first determine definitions of accuracy and latency and develop a better understanding of what IPCTS testing criteria should be and how testing should be scored. Um, members also discussed surveying IPCTS users and providers on what they feel are reasonable metrics and what they consider as being functionally equivalent. And that's all I have. Thanks, Rochelle. Are there any questions for the Relay and Equipment Distribution Subcommittee? All right. I'd like to move on to the Emergency Communications Subcommittee. So, uh, Susan and Mark. Are Mark, or, are Mark or Richard here? Uh, Richard's not. Okay. Uh, Susan, you might be solo. It sounds that way. <laughs> and, I, and I will have a question for you, Will, um, later in the report. So at the um, October 16th meeting, the Emergency Communications Subcommittee presented and provided a report um, with recommendations regarding real-time text. At that meeting, the DAC asked this emergency uh, Communications Subcommittee to address and expand what was Section 3 of that report. Um, basically, they recommended further the, the Emergency Communications Subcommittee collaborate with public safety professionals, organizations to develop and circulate material, including real-time text education for PSAPs, uh, determine appropriate contact information for facilitating coordination between PSAPs and wireless companies, and to uh, look at talking points or educational materials for consumer advocacy organizations um, for the benefit of real-time text in emergency communications to PSAPs. Um, at the time of the, this report, the, uh, the Emergency Communications Subcommittee has um, focused on points one and three, real-time text educational materials for PSAPs and talking points or educational materials for consumer advocacy organizations about the benefits of real-time text. Um, at this point, um, the committee will not provide a specific recommendation. Um, but expects to provide a recommendation in future meetings. Uh, the subcommittee will further address appropriate contact information at that time. Um, one of the items that the DAC recommended was the acceleration of RTT adoption by PSAPs um, by developing a fact sheet for PSAPs on real-time text. We felt that the PSAPs needed um, some basic understanding about real-time text and how it would work with TTYs. Um, we have in the subcommittee circulated a draft which is currently being um, reviewed by the subcommittee. Um, once we have a final draft, we can work with the appropriate associations to distribute to the PSEPs. So my, my procedural question is, um, does that draft need to come through the full DAC before it is circulated outside um, with the associations? Or does that come later? Um, after a draft or a combined draft is is developed. <coughs> this is Will. So uh, this is Will Shell, and I don't know. 
<laughs> okay. Okay. So we will do whatever we're told to do later. Oh, okay. So Karen, this is Karen. Okay. So if you are intending to um, make that draft a DAC product then it would have to come through the full DAC. Okay. However, if you choose to disseminate it independently by your organizations, then it would not have to be approved by the DAC, okay. so long as there's an understanding by the subcommittee that you're not um, going to be using it as a DAC product, although at some point the lines may become blurred. So if you are anticipating not making it a DAC product, you may want to work more along the lines of um, what the um, video programming committee is talking about doing, where they're going to be developing best practices outside of the subcommittee and taking it outside of the subcommittee. Okay, um, well, I will take this back to the emergency subcommittee and we will move forward in whatever way they deem best. Okay, But in alignment with the requirements for the uh, DACA. Right. Um, we have done some other activities. We've done some initial testing. Brian, Ian, Linda, and Scott have been performing real-time text um, testing in various configurations, um, and we'll be developing more in-depth talking points and FAQs. Um, we're also taking feedback on low vision and braille display users um, into account in this, and um, some of the information has already been passed on to Apple um, and to make some improvements in the user interface. Um, Scott has also done some um, 911 test calls and set up in Charlotte, North Carolina using real-time text in March. In addition, a meeting between Richard Ray, Donna Platt, and Nina headquarters um, was held during the Standards and Best Practices Conference in Orlando in January 15th through 18th. Um, the aforementioned points as well as several topics were discussed and is currently being worked on. Um, we were pleased to inform the DAC that NENA Educational Advisory Board will assist on two points. One is the development of real-time text educational webinar materials for PABS, PSAPs and to collaborate with the AC and FCC to establish working groups with PSAPs, wireless companies, and SMEs to focus on educational materials development. The amount of support from uh, the amount of support the DAC and emergency communication subcommittees has received from Nina has uh, for this project has been tremendous. On February 22nd, the um, emergency communication subcommittees had their meeting, and Joe Marks from AT&T, Mark Gerber from NOAA, and Helena Mitchell from the Wireless RERC provide presentations. Um, the topics included real-time text and SMS to 911 via various networks, uh, NOAA, and the FM radio chip activation. On February 27th, Richard Ray and Tony Dunn, fo former co-chair of the EC subcommittee, attended the NINA conference and presented um, from the California chapter mission critical training event a topic, uh, what real-time text is replacing TTYs? So there's uh, a fair amount of outreach that is, is going on now. Um, HR 582, which was Kerry's Law, um, the ability to reach 911 with access, um, direct access through multi-line telephone systems um, is, um, so as opposed to going dial 9 to get to the outside the hotel, that type of thing. Um, or eight outside the hotel um, is has been under consideration. In December of 2013, um, Carrie Hunt died when her nine-year-old daughter apparently tri dialed 911 from the hotel room but couldn't get outside the hotel. Um, Hank Hunt, who was Carrie's father, took uh, on the task of advocating for a new law, and Carrie's law mandates three simple things: direct access to 911 with or without an access code on-site notification of the call event to staff and directly routing to a 911 center, not to an internal endpoint. Mark Fletcher, ENP, Dan Wilson, ENP, Kevin Kennedy, CEO of Avaya, Ke Kelly Merriweather and Robert Gonzalez of the Texas Commission on State Emergency Communications and the FCC Commissioner Ajit Pai were involved in this effort. On Friday, May 15th, 2016, Governor Abbott of Texas signed um, Kerry's law, and the law went into effect on the 1st of September. 
on January 12th of 2017, um, this bill, H.R. 582, was introduced to the Senate. Senate, hmm. And the bill, that doesn't make sense, um, H.R. requires all multi-line telephone systems to have a default communication configuration that directly dials 911 without the need of additional digits. Um, on August 3rd, 2017, the bill passed through the Senate on February, Friday, February 9th, which would have been Carrie's 36th birthday. The Congress approved H.R. 582 and sent it to the President, who signed it on February 16th um, on the anniversary of the first, uh, the 50th anniversary of the first 911 call in Haleyville, Alabama. Um, and we had people from the committee attending the event um, and with the president, and, as well as Ajit Pai, who championed this from the beginning. This simple law will ensure direct access to any environment so that anyone, including those with a disability, can reach 911 on any device anywhere. So I'm sorry I didn't have uh, Fletch or, or Ray or Linda here to read this, but <laughs> I hope this makes sense and this is our, our report. That's all right, Susan. You did just fine, and thank you very much for your report. Are there any questions for the Emergency Communications Subcommittee? All right. I would like to get the Technology Transition Subcommittee report in before the break, and it looks like, Zainab, you're on your own today. This is Zainab speaking from the National Association of the Deaf. I am running solo today, unfortunately. My co-chair couldn't be here. But I am jealous, actually. She's in Las Vegas having a spa day. So <laughs> I'll go ahead and share our report. We are planning an RTT refreshable Braille screen reader workshop on April 9th. It will run from 10 in the morning to 3.30 in the afternoon and will consist of four sessions. The first session will be demos and testing. So it's an opportunity for people to have hands-on experience for the deafblind community and other participants as well on RTT refreshable Braille screen readers. The next session will be a discussion of what we have learned from the demos, what seem to have worked versus what opportunities there might be for improvement. The third panel of the day will be an industry perspective regarding technical compatibility. And then we'll close with a discussion of next steps with representatives from the earlier three sessions, hopefully leading to a recommendation for the June meeting of the DAC. The other topic that we're working on, we're still gathering information on, which is encouraging RTT integration into relay service operations. We are beginning to formulate a recommendation on that topic, and that recommendation should be ready for the June meeting. So we are hoping to have two recommendations for the full DAC to vote on in our June meeting. And that concludes the report. Thank you. Thank you, Zainab. I have a quick question. Is the RTT Refreshable Braille Roundtable open to the public? This is Zainab speaking. We are sending out invitations for the roundtable. We discussed it with the FCC uh, in terms of specific logistics, and we are handling it by an invitation basis. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions for the Technology Transition Subcommittee? Brian, go ahead. This is Brian speaking. I want to say I'm very excited about this forum. I'm very much looking forward to that day. I'd like to mention that in that project, uh, Susan, something that Susan said, uh, Scott was also involved in the analysis of the RTT um, project, and we have seen some opportunities um, that we are hoping to apply to the forum upcoming. I want to make sure when you have your outcomes, please don't do what other technology companies have done for many years, 
which is produce a summary under one sort of bucket and calling it accessibility technologies. Rather, distinguish the different types of technologies for the different types of accessibility needs. Sometimes people misplace the blame because it's under one bucket, whether it's a UI issue or something else. So I'd like to just encourage um, those findings from the forum to be broken out by category and p to be distinguished so that we really have a good sense of what the problems are and how we might go about solving them. Any other questions for the Technology Transition Subcommittee? Zainab, would you like to respond? Yes, I would. This is Zainab responding to Brian. Thank you for your comment. Uh, the goal of the roundtable really is for this to be uh, deaf, blind driven and focused. So we are hoping that the deaf blind community will come out and give direct feedback to the vendors and the companies. Um, the last session term in determining the direction of the recommendation. We really want to that recommendation to be from the deaf blind community. And so we uh, thank you in advance for your input and hope that you'll feel comfortable sharing with us um, that, and hopefully that will address your concerns. Any other questions for the Technology Transition Subcommittee? Everett, go ahead. Hi, this is Everett. Hi, this is not on yet. There he goes. Hi, this is Everett Bacon with uh, NFB. Um, quick question. With, with regards to the invitation, um, it, can we make suggestions for you to invite individuals that we know of that that might have you know good inf information for this? This is Anab. What we did was um, previous subcommittee meetings. We basically asked for ideas and suggestions for who ought to be there for organizations and stakeholders and so forth. We put that list together. That list is ready. The invitations haven't gone out yet, but they're, they're meant to go out this Friday. So if you have a specific suggestion, I would see, say please send it to myself and Linda before this Friday. We don't have very much time. Um, so we would like to confirm you know, the RSVPs and so forth in a timely fashion. I welcome suggestions, but just it has to be done before this Friday, please. Any last questions? All right, thank you, Zainab, for your report. Um, it is now break time, and so during the break, we are going to be doing something very special. We're going to be cel celebrating Elaine and her wonderful service to the DAC and cutting a cake, and there will be a slideshow. So this gives me a quick opportunity to sneak in a very quick thank you to Elaine myself, personal thank you. Um, I couldn't have done this job without Elaine. Thank you for all of your invaluable hard work and help and support keeping Lisa and I in line and getting our jobs done. And most important of all, thank you for laughing at my jokes. <laughs> and with that being said, I'd like uh, people to be back by 2.30 and we will see you then. Next, we are going to hear some announcements and updates from various DAC members and the organizations that they represent. So the first organization is the Gallaudet Rehabilitation Engineering and Research Center. And so for that, I would like to invite Christian and Linda to present. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Linda Cosmas Vitek, and I'm a senior research audiologist in the Technology Access Program at Gallaudet. And I'm also Christian Vogler's alternate um, here on the DAC. He had to leave to go teach a class and give a midterm exam. So <laughs> I'm um, here to describe alternate. Um, here on the DAC, he had to leave to go teach a class and give a midterm exam. So <laughs> I'm um, here to describe a little bit 
about um, the technology access program and um, highlight a couple of the projects that we're working on. Um, as I said, Christian and I are both are in the technology access program, or TAP, T-A-P for short. Um, we're a research unit at Gallaudet, and we have um, a number of grants. One of them Will mentioned, which is the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Technology Rehabilitation Engineering Research Center, or RERC for short. Um, Christian and I co-direct that particular center, and we also have um, some other grants, um, one from CTA, and I'll be talking a little bit about that grant, as well as some of the projects on the RERC. I'm going to start with our um, CTA foundation grant and describe that very briefly. Um, this is a project actually that I don't work on, but Christian and Norman Williams work on this. Um, it is about accessible IoT-based visual home alerting. Um, it is not part of the RERC again, but um, something that's funded by the CTA Foundation. The purpose of the home alerting project is really to migrate special purpose home visual alerting systems for people who are deaf and hard of hearing to off-the-shelf mainstream systems. Um, special purpose systems are stuck somewhat in the analog age and really don't interoperate with current digital smart home and IoT technologies. This creates two issues or problems for the community. One is that smart homes and IoT are still largely inaccessible. And the second is that people have to spend quite a bit of money on special systems on top of what they might buy in the mainstream. Um, so our goals with this project was to use mainstream lights like Philips U or LifeX and devices to make IoT-based events and notifications accessible to people who are deaf and hard of hearing really anywhere in their homes, even if they don't have the phone that they have on them. Um, so we're looking to make smart homes and IoT accessible by supporting visual and tactile notifications of events in existing smart home systems, by supporting event notifications through smart light color patterns and app notifications, and um, enable deaf and hard of hearing consumers really to keep up with new smart home technologies without losing their accessible home setups. It's not uncommon for app notifications either to use a smart home hub's native app or Bluetooth-based systems that hook up to native apps. And what we've created is the technology to bridge events and notifications with flashing light colors and patterns appropriate for deaf and hard of hearing individuals. Um, current pilot runs on Samsung SmartThings, um, but, they're also, but we're also talking to um, other vendors. And we currently support door knocks, doorbells, fire alarms, RJ11 phone jacks, water alarms, smart locks, um, custom alerts, and IFTTT. Um, that stands for if this, then that, which um, allows us to create appellets that um, allow apps and other devices to work together. So that's a little um, summary of the home alerting project we have through the CTA Foundation. What I'm going to move on to next is a very brief description of um, the RERC and highlight a couple of our activities that um, you all might be interested in. The RERC um, has six projects, three um, development projects and three research projects. It is a center grant. It's five years, and we partner with a lot of people around the country, including University of Iowa, University of Colorado Boulder, um, University of Pittsburgh, um, American Institutes for Research, um, Hearing Loss Association of America, and I'm going to be highlighting the project that we do with them. It's a com uh, consumer training program and um, other folks within the center. Um, again, I said we had three research and three development projects. I'm just going to talk very briefly because I only have 
10 minutes about um, a training project that we do in cooperation with Hearing Loss Association of America. Lisa and I work very closely together on that project along with American Institutes for Research. The consumer training program is called Network of Consumer Hearing Assistive Technology Trainers, um, or NCHAT for short. The purpose of this particular project is really to increase autonomy of people who could benefit from the use of communication technologies. And we have a number of goals for this particular project. One is to build a sustainable training approach on strategies to enhance effective use of hearing assistive and emerging technology, to increase the technology capacity of consumer organizations like HLAA to enhance their outreach, to provide assistance and resources to people with hearing loss and their families in order to learn about effective use of technology, and finally to develop a training framework and set of best practices. That training framework is not specific to the hearing, hard of hearing or deaf communities. It's really something that any consumer, disability consumer organization might be able to take up and make use of, even though our particular program that we've been working on now in our fourth year is related to the hard of hearing community. Um, we focus on consumers as trainers, um, as you could tell from the title of the program. We really um, think it's very, very important that we involve consumers in this way because they can serve as professional collaborators and diffuse knowledge and skills among themselves. They can serve as models of consumer control and confidence for other consumers. Um, they have at their disposal life experiences to draw on for understanding personal, social, and workplace needs expressed by the people they're training, other consumers they're training, and they can provide examples of lessons learned and problem-solving approaches. Um, they go through a year-long journey, um, and the first step in that journey is the application process. So we actually wind up having, um, in some cases, several hundred people who view the application for this consumer training program and apply. Um, and we have a rubric for selecting our applicants, but we have a very limited number that we select every year. It's on the order of 12 to 15 people. Um, and they go through um, a six-month process of um, doing online module work. So this is a blended learning approach. We use that online part at the beginning of the training, and then we actually bring everyone together here um, in the Washington, D.C. area for a two-day face-to-face training. And then again at the Hearing Loss Association convention, and what the trainers then are expected to do is actually go out and do trainings. They're required to do three if they're accepted into the program. It's been really um, a great experience. We're on our third cohort, so um, once this cohort completes, we'll have trained 25 individuals who have then gone out and um, the at least first two cohorts have trained more than 300 consumers with hearing loss. So it's been quite a nice um, program and we'll complete the program with our fo fourth cohort next year. Um, one other thing I'm going to highlight from the work of the RERC is um, our standards work. Um, this is not a research or development project, but it's really um, uh, another piece that's uh, probably more along the lines of technical assistance. We participate in a lot of standards development. C63.19 um, is one of them that, if you're not familiar with what that standard is, it's, um, it describes the methods of measurement for compatibility between wireless cell phones, essentially, and hearing aids. And that work has been um, ongoing for many years, but most recently it's coming up on its third or fourth revision, and we've been participating um, in that work. It started in 2015 with um, a project initiation piece, and then for the last two years we've been working on that um, revision. We're in the process of finalizing 
the editing for that. Um, there's a small editing group um, within the larger working group of the standard. Um, um, the next meeting for the standard is in April, and we hope to have um, a final product that can then go to ballot. So I'm going to stop there um, and see if there are any questions with regard to uh, any of the topics I covered or anything else with regard to the technology access program. Thank you. Scott, go ahead. Thank you, and uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It uh, sounds like you have a lot of things going on. Uh, with particular interest on the, uh, the things you're doing with the signalers and the Internet of Things, um, I wonder if any consideration has been given to uh, those who are deafblind. Uh, for example, I have a watch on right now that is a four-cell Braille display, and it would be great if I could get notifications on my smartwatch that I always have with me as to uh, what those notifications are. And if not, is that something that you guys would be interested in pursuing? Thank you. So um, you might have um, noticed when I first started talking about that one particular project, that's the one that I'm not um, completely involved in. So I'm going to ask that I can take that question back to Christian. Um, or um, if you prefer, you could email him directly and ask him about that. But um, I will definitely make mention that that question came up. And, um, and, and hopefully, you two will be able to get together to discuss that further. Because I think, in fact, he would be very interested in pursuing something like that. Um, we strongly, of course, support the deafblind community. Um, and so he would be very interested in getting that feedback from you. I'm sorry I can't answer that particular question, though. All right. Unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions for Linda. If uh, folks have any questions for Linda, how can they get in contact with you? Um, you can email me. I should have, because I'm Christian's alternate, you should be able to have, I'm assuming I'm looking at Lisa, that the um, list of members have email addresses so um, that they have access to, so you should be able to get in touch with me. But it's lynda.cosmosbtech at galadet.edu. It's, it's kind of a long <laughs> name, so I suggest maybe looking that up, or we have a, a website tap.galadet.edu um, that you should be able to find um, contact information for us there. Great. So if folks have difficulty reaching Linda, then I would suggest uh, going through Christian and it can get to her. All right. Next, I'd like to move on to Deaf Blind Citizens in Action. So, uh, Mussy, please go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Masi Geber. That's G-E-B-R-E. -E. I'm from Northern California. And I am here representing Deafblind Citizens in Action, DBCA. And I serve in that role with Jamie Taylor. So to uh, bring you up to speed with DBCA, I'm not sure uh, if, if, if people here are familiar with the organization. We're an advocacy organization, an education organization. We were founded in 2009 as a leadership development class at Gallaudet University, partnering with Helen Keller National Center, HKNC, and Texas Technology University to empower young people who identify as deafblind to become successful leaders in their home communities. And it became a formal organization uh, as a nonprofit, 501c3. We started with six young deafblind members. We've had the opportunity to meet with President Obama in 2009 and have just had amazing experiences uh, meeting other deafblind people in our communities. One year later, 
that program encouraged the 21, 21st century, the CVAA, to, um, we were involved in that, those efforts as well. And we helped that to become law. And that was October 10th. I believe that it was in 2010, rather. And so we're still involved in leadership activities. A leadership program and has grown from that time to the organization you see here before you today is Deaf Blind Citizens in Action. That leadership program in conjunction with HKNC uh, for its beginning, and now it is a separate organization. And again, our focus is on empowering young people up to the age of 30 to be successful leaders in their home communities from the deafblind community. And we are going to various events here in Washington, D.C. This summer, there'll be some leadership opportunities and classes. Uh, there'll be a week-long class here in D.C., and we'll be bringing a group of about 12 young adults to meet with members of the federal government, federal agencies, and a variety of other individuals in the city, including the FCC, Department of Education. Department of Justice, and so on. We're hoping to afford these young people the opportunity to meet with movers and shakers in our government, members of Congress, so that they can learn about the policy-making procedures and then apply that experience back in their home communities, towns, and states. We're focusing on three, we have three big areas of focus. One is technology, second is education, and the third is community access, including transportation, for example, and support service providers known as SSPs. We're really pushing for SSPs on a, a national level and for uh, technology to always be inclusive of our needs, our communication needs, vis-a-vis -vis access for the deafblind community. There are tremendous barriers for our community vis-a-vis -vis communication and access, so that is at the heart of what we do. We want to see deafblind citizens involved in all aspects of technology enhancement. That's basically uh, the story of DBCA, Deaf Blind Citizens in Action. If there are any questions, I'm happy to entertain them. No questions. All right, thank you, Mussy. Next up, we have Tim Cregan from the Access Board. Okay, good afternoon. Tim Cregan from the U.S. Access Board. Once again, I find myself at the end of the agenda keeping you from freedom. <laughs> so I will be as expeditious as possible. So the U.S. Access Board is a very small, executive branch agency. So that means that um, in the scheme of government, we, we work for and report to the president. Having said that, um, one of our primary responsibilities is developing technical assistance and um, implementing regulations. So oftentimes what Congress will do is they will delegate that authority to the executive branch agencies that have developed expertise. So to that end, um, we have had rulemaking committees, about 
12 years ago, I was the DFO for a federal rulemaking committee called TITAC. So every time Will had to make a decision, I felt his pain. <laughs> um, it's, it's a very involved, specific process. The point of a rulemaking committee is to bring together the major stakeholders on any given issue and to see where they can come to points of commonality, points of disagreement, and then to see what they can do to develop solutions. Um, my personal experience with that was very rich and rewarding, and it eventually resulted in the refreshed, the revised Section 508 standards of the Rehabilitation Act and the uh, revised Section 255 guidelines of the Telecommunications Act. So what that means is, for those of you <coughs> who follow this, Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act addresses the accessibility of information and communications technologies in the federal environment. And it applies to federal agencies when they use, procure, maintain, or develop information and communications technology. So, um, we have, have an extensive training program on the standards, and they became effective and required for all federal agencies must comply with them as of January 18th of this year. Now, the interesting thing about standards is that although the law says that 508 law applies to federal agencies, the technical requirements themselves may be adapted to and apply to other entities under different laws. So for example, under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, or entities receiving federal funds, some of them are required to follow 508 technical requirements by their granting, by their granting entities. Other cases, states have passed requirements that entities within the state must follow 508. For example, a state may decide that all of the official communications and state websites or state educational systems should follow the 508 standards. Um, having said that, so what happens is, is we get a lot of questions. A big part of our job after we do the, after the rulemaking is the follow-up of training and technical assistance. Um, so we get a lot of questions from state entities and we get a lot of questions from uh, entities that are also covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA. So under Title II, which is state and local governments, which are required to provide programmatic access and officially communicate, uh, effectively communicate about their programmatic activities, they may look to Section 508 accessibility standards to uh, make their content accessible. accessible. Similarly, under Title III, places of public accommodation may do the same. Um, so we provide training and technical assistance on these issues. Um, the, in addition to the uh, training and technical assistance, we have a bi-monthly webinar series, which I've hosted, co-hosted for the past six years with uh, Deborah Kaplan of Health and Human Services. Um, we have a webinar coming up next month. It's going to be on effective communication under Section 508 and how to make your content accessible. Um, for information on the webinars, including all of the archived webinars going back six years, we, uh, I would suggest you go to the Access Board website, which is www.access, that's A-C-C-E-S-S hyphen B-O-A-R-D.gov. A lot of good information there. Um, finally, we do a lot of training. We present at conferences. Uh, for those of you who are aware of the CSUN, uh, assistive Technology Conference, which will be in California. Uh, at the end of March, we're going to be presenting there with a group of federal agencies. This year, our training and technical assistance has shifted its focus from going over what are the textual requirements of the 508 standards to implementation. Um, it's implementation in the federal sphere, but it can be used across a wide variety of spectra. So to that end, we've developed uh, technical assistance and best practices with other federal agencies. And that may be found at www.section508.gov. Um, just real briefly, in addition to the 508 piece that the agency does, we also do um, uh, enforcement under the Architectural Barriers Act, which is, I would characterize it as 
many of the technical requirements similar to those under the ADA, except it's applied to federal facilities. So for example, if someone has an inaccessible local post office, they would file a complaint either on our website or they could file a complaint with their congressman or someone and it would eventually come to our office and we have a separate enforcement division which handles those issues. Um, we also have an important function in that we work very collaboratively and closely with other federal agencies on disability issues. We also work, uh, have a lot of outreach and we work with disability groups, standards groups, all sorts of different entities on disability issues, either development of standards or just raising consciousness on the issues. So um, just like uh, with Linda, you all have my contact information. Um, the best way to probably reach me is really easy, just 508 at access-board.gov. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Thanks, Tim. Thank you. And for uh, those who don't know, the Access Board also develops the Telecommunications Act Accessibility Guidelines, which are used to inform the uh, FCC rules under Section 255 as well. Uh, that's all of the scheduled announcements that we have. Uh, it was brought to my attention that the DAC was featured in TDI's uh, latest newsletter. Um, Claude, if people are interested in reading about that, where can they go to read that? This is Claude. Oh, I'm sorry, I need to wait for the camera. Okay, this is Claude. I'll be working with Will um, to disseminate um, accessibility PDF um, on our, on our mag in our magazine that covers, uh, that touches on these themes. So you can find a lot of information there. It's very interesting and very useful. Great, thank you, Claude. Uh, for those who are attending the CSUN Assistive Technology Conference, I will be uh, giving a talk in partnership with AT&T about making real-time text accessible to individuals who are deafblind and some of the work that we did uh, partnering with AT&T on that front. And so feel free to attend, at least uh, just to heckle me. And uh, is there anybody else presenting at CSUN in the room? Yes, uh, Karen is presenting at CSUN. Helena and Helena, all right. And, and Tim. And Tim, yes. So uh, feel free to drop by my sessions if you'll be there. All right, so now we are going to open up the floor for new business. So is there any new business that uh, would, people would like to bring to the committee? Helena, go ahead. Hey, everybody. So uh, t earlier today, the video programming committee presented, and I would like to make a suggestion to Thomas and the rest of that subcommittee that they give some thought to developing milestones, um, how they're going to get to the five-year five timeline. And I have three reasons for that. Actually, one was during the break, several people came up to me and, and my own team saying, you know, what they need to have is time stone, I mean milestones because technology is just changing too fast. So that's reason one. Number two is the pace of technology is changing fast. What they're going to find is some of the things they think are important today, five years from now, are already going to be outpaced by how industry is doing it. And at our center, we practice what we call cost correction. Every 10 months, we take a look at what technologies we're talking about developing. We see if industry has a hold on it or who's working on it. So we think that's really important. And uh, so that's just our suggestion that they take a look at creating some milestones to help them get through uh, three, five, seven, one, even this first year. But that's our suggestion to them. Susan, go ahead. This is really not news business, but it is old business and current business because um, just in case people think that Elaine just worked for deaf people, that was not true. Um, she also is instrumental in the warning systems on the, um, on the platforms. 
subway platforms. And um, so every time you are safe, you get to thank her for all that work. Yeah. Thanks, Susan. Any other new business? I don't believe it. We are two minutes ahead of schedule. How did that happen? All right, so we're going to open up the floor now for public participation. This is the time for the public to submit comments and um, speak on any issues. So is, are there any members of the public who would like to speak at this time? All right, Will, go ahead. So while the uh, crowd lines up at the standing microphone, uh, I'll mention uh, the a few emails that came in over live questions at FCC.gov. <clears throat> um, I'll start with the easiest ones. Uh, so Willie King asked, "Do uh, does the DAC have any individuals who uh, are deaf?" And I'll answer the question for Willie. Um, Willie, the DAC has a wide diversity of people with disabilities and uh, people without disabilities who represent industry um, and other stakeholders in the uh, in the community. Deaf people are certainly uh, represented, uh, as so are a whole number of other uh, disabilities. Uh, another uh, public comment is from Lisa Torres. She says, I have been a broadcast closed captioned for 18 years, and I'm speaking on behalf of 900 other captioners who would like to show our services to any group or committee who may have concerns about quality. The deaf and hard of hearing are viewing more broadcast captioning through a voice-to-text service that is not up to quality standards that we believe they claim to be. Is it possible for you to have all current caption providers to show their services and let the consumers decide? Secondly, teleprompters are not showing captions when a reporter is located outside of the studio. That is another type of tool that should not be used to deliver captioning. Thank you. And uh, I should just mention in response to uh, Lisa Torres's comment that uh, if you feel like there is a caption quality issue that you observe uh, that fits within our captioning rules, you should feel free to file a complaint uh, uh, with our office. You can find all the rules and complaint processes at FCC.gov slash disability. And please. So this is Karen. I just want to add also in response, as many people around the table know, because you were very involved in this, in 2014 we adopted enhanced electronic newsroom technique rules, which do continue to allow the use of the teleprompter, but expect that the programming, the captioning on such programming that's using teleprompters uh, will uh, do a far better job of capturing the content, the oral content, of um, a program than it did in the past, and our rules are very specific on what that means. So um, unlike in the past where teleprompters missed a lot of information, there are a lot more methods nowadays to capture a lot more information even when teleprompters are used. Uh, this is Will Shell again. Uh, I wanted to read a, a little bit of a summary of 25 or m maybe more uh, submissions to live questions. The first submission was from Dustin Gibson, so I will uh, put his name out there. Good for you, Dustin. Uh, the question is, I'm sending this to ask why deaf prisoners don't have access to telecommunications. Shouldn't it be an accommodation covered under the ADA? And what is the FCC doing about this? Would anyone like to answer that question? I'm, I'm uh, not the best person for this. Yes, why don't you take it? Go for it. 
Dustin, is that his name? Yeah. Dustin, thank you for your question. Uh, and oh, the, other, the other 30 or 25. so, 25 were similar. Uh, yes, uh, Dustin, you are correct. The Americans with Disabilities Act, specifically Title II, does cover uh, the right of a deaf inmate to access to telecommunications and any other kind of communications within a prison. Uh, unfortunately, it is a under-enforced provision of the law. And also, un unfortunately, the FCC does not, does not enforce the Americans with Disabilities Act. That's the Department of Justice's um, area. However, we are fortunate that the Americans with Disabilities Act does provide a private right of action. And there's a number of groups that work with deaf inmates to uh, ensure their rights uh, to telecommunication services and other communication services. Uh, I think that the, probably the primary one is sitting right here at the table, the National Association of the Deaf and their legal, uh, their, their, their legal services. So uh, I, that's, that would be my response. Thank you. Great, so we would like to uh, open up the floor for any additional public comment or questions. Not all at once. <laughs> all right, next stack is June 14th. Yes. Okay. All right, well, I don't believe this. We actually finished early. This, oh, Elaine, we, we have to turn it over to you for, for some parting words. This is Elaine. I just, uh, real quick, just wanted to say thank you to everyone. You are all so kind. I can't think of a better way to end my career than with you people. I just, it, it, it's just been perfect. Uh, Karen and others talked a lot about the past, but you guys are the future. And I've been so excited, so uh, impressed, and so, it's been so rewarding to work with you on all these issues. I, I just really, really loved it. It was just perfect. So thank you so much. I, I really count all of you as my friends and, and my inspiration. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elaine. It truly has been an honor and a pleasure working with you, and I, and I sincerely mean that. Um, so our next DAC meeting is going to be on June 14th. And so we look forward to seeing all of you there. I'm, I'm, right now, here. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. <laughs> all right. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to Will. Uh, I, before the final announcement, I know what happens when someone says it's over. Everyone just gets up and leaves. And I have a few uh, housekeeping uh, issues to cover. One is that there is going to be a subcommittee meeting in this room and we're going to try to change this room over from being a public meeting to being a closed subcommittee only meeting so that means the public and anyone not part of that subcommittee is going to have to uh, find the exit uh, and there's also going to be a second working group meeting this is the uh, working group that is part of the video programming subcommittee uh, please meet me just outside the doors and uh, I will gather up the uh, small number of you and we will go to a second room upstairs where you need a, an escort in order to travel so uh, I will escort you what time? What time? Um, that will be uh, within 15 minutes of the end of this meeting we will try to start the subcommittee meeting in here as quickly as we can, but we will need to do some changeover, and we will need to, you know, shoo everyone out the door. There's a few logistics, so just bear that in mind. We'll start both meetings as quickly as we can, but within 15 minutes of the end of this, I'll meet people outside that room. Uh, the doors here. The doors here. Relay. Relay subcommittee meeting is, is in here. Thanks for, uh, thanks for taking uh, on those announcements, Will. 
uh, you're certainly more qualified than me to take those on. So I appreciate your doing that. And with that, we will see you all on June 14th. So thanks for coming.